We're going live as Doctor Strange. There we go. Oh, yeah. Fear Good Jared's evening. mystic powers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Is there anyone? Let's find out. I actually have no idea. <laughs> we got one person I see there. One person, yeah. They got to see the light show. Yeah. A lot of people on the rewind will catch it. <laughs> Just discovered that we're Apple has these built-in, you know, shows whenever they do their video, like the uh <laughs> my my favorite is still what the balloons the, the oh no, that's the is the the balloons are the two thumbs up, uh two piece sign. Oh no, that's the no, confetti. The, the, the one is the balloons. I'll get to it sooner or later. <laughs> I like how it makes balloons come up behind me and in front of me. Mm. It's a but full package. We were just full of fooling around with hand gestures and discovered the Doctor Strange one does something. Mm -hmm. Come on, give it to me. Oh, you're teasing me now. There we go. I have, I have to have the thumbs tucked in. That's the key. Yep. We were trying various combinations of gestures, see if any worked, and we found found that one. That one works, yeah. Good evening, Tit Goblin. How are you tonight? Do -do 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 -do. I paid attention to the zero things in uh, regarding comics this week. Zero. I, I'm happy to report. I don't think anyone died in the comic book world this week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't see that anyone died. Right. Though I did see someone complaining about Roy Thomas. <laughs> That's the new sport. Everyone's <laughs> favorite sport now. Pink Floyd laser show just made Tit Goblin blind. It was actually a complaint from um, 2015. Mm. That, oh, I forget who it was. It was um, um, someone who was the one who brought Star Wars comic to Marvel. Can't remember mm -hmm. his name. That Roy Thomas takes credit for. Um, but it's it's in the People's History of Comics. Um, they reposted it. And mm -hmm. at one point, I guess back in 2015, Roy Thomas was trying to take credit for Star Wars and for promoting Star Wars. And he said nobody at you know Lucasfilm or whatever promoted the comic. That was up to us or something like that. And the guy who was actually in charge of bringing the comic to Marvel back in 2015 said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you talking about? Marvel did nothing to promote the Star Wars comic. And then he went through the list of things he personally did to promote the Star Wars comic in his... Uh, Capat whatever capacity he had. And then he pointed out that Marvel in their other comics didn't even promote Star Wars comic. They promoted Pizzazz, their magazine for teenagers, more prominently than they promoted Star Wars. As a matter of fact, they used the Star Wars comic to promote other Marvel stuff. So it was like, um, so it was, um, this guy has since died. I think they said he died in 2019, but his wife runs his Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So she reposted this because Roy Thomas was taking credit for Wolverine. <laughs> so, yeah, here's where he tried to take credit for my husband's work. <laughs> yeah. So I found that interesting. <laughs> they were in Star, War Star Wars comics and pizzazz. Were there? I don't remember. There I just were, right? I, I, I used to have a subscription to Pizzazz, but I don't rem I remember. I don't remember. I think it was I, the they Daily Strip. At least one Star Wars cover, right? Mm -hmm. But I think they put they put the Daily Strip inside. Was it the, that's right. They had one page of comics. I don't remember what it was. I was just writing on um, Stupid Chainsaw Production. He's a YouTuber I follow who's a comic book and movie guy. But he's really into the Star Wars expanded universe. Mm -hmm. um, so he he's he does he does reviews of all you know. He's been he's 
reviews like all the st old Star Wars and new Star Wars stuff, and and he's he's just he just was reviewing the um, Star Wars omnibus of the Marvel years, and he got up to the he was up to the Empire Strikes Back adaptation. But you know, he's of course considerably younger than me, so I was letting him know that, um, like I said, those. Those, you know, these, the, the, it was the, um, in the 80s, it was, I think, Marvel Super Special 16 was the collectible thing. Mm -hmm. Because that was where the uh, Empire adaptation first appeared. And the comics, like, everybody poo pooed because they were reprints of the Marvel Super Special 16. So if you mm -hmm. were a Star Wars fan and wanted the first printing, uh, that's what you got. But now the magazine is almost forgotten. Right. So no one even remembers it exists. Because format. Right, because format. Then he also reviewed, uh, I think this week, the another Lucasfilm film, the, the first two issues of the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read those. No. I forget who the writer was, but John Byrne was the artist. Yeah, I read a few because they published it in Captain America in Brazil, but I don't remember reading the the adaptations or even the first stories because the the ones I, I I think I saw some early Mazzucchelli. Okay, yeah, uh, but but they, I didn't they, read the, the Bird Walter Wars. Simonson even I think somewhere in there. But the, I, I still remember the, getting those first two issues off, off the stands. They were really good. You could tell they were really trying to make it this seat-of-your-pants movie serial like the movie. And I remember being really into those first two issues because John Byrne at the height of his powers, you know. Um, and then they were off it by the third issue. And it was just, I was like, ooh, this one's going to break the cycle of mediocre Marvel licensed properties. Because John Byrne was on it. But then by the third issue, they 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 pieced out. They said, see ya. I think they had trouble with Shooter or something. Who knows? But it was just mediocre Marvel movie property. <laughs> I was like, yeah. ah. But I, I think that Indiana Jones is easy to write a comic about because they... You would think so. Be, it's a, <laughs> but it, it is. No, you can just do something generic and it works because it, it's a it's an action hero. Yeah, I'm just saying those first two issues were special. The stuff mm -hmm. I read after that was mediocre. Huh. What is Tit Goblin saying here? It's nice to see New York City full of people again. I'm hoping the same... Will happen here soon. Your walk videos are great population insight for pedestrian commerce. That's right. I uh, I posted one of my walk and talk videos where I went up to Greeley Square. Greeley Square, and that thing is a park. And yeah. That park. That park is the is almost the the, the size of a uh, of a of an ice cream stand. It is tiny, and it was even <laughs> tinier before they closed Broadway. Oh, because the park itself is like a sliver. It's it's not even half a block wide. Right. That's why. That's why I, I was amazed they call it a park. <laughs> right. But 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 what like happens a good, is like a gazebo. Like Midtown Manhattan is a grid. Mm -hmm. You know, with the avenues going east and west. No, pardon. The streets going east and west, and the avenues going north and south. But Broadway runs diagonally through the avenues. Mm -hmm. So there's like one diagonal line through this grid. They discovered, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, that that was a really bad idea for traffic. Mm -hmm. And if they closed down parts of Broadway, it alleviated traffic congestion. Because you got a diagonal street running through the grid. Yeah. Well, they um, have one. They have one in Barcelona. Barcelona is a surprisingly modern, modern city in terms of layout. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much a, a, grid, a grid city, uh, and they ha do have a, a diagonal avenue running through it. The thing is, the diagonal is the the main road to go through Barcelona. Ah, so everything else uh, feeds into it. Okay, but so what they did was like Greeley Square. 
which why is it called Greeley Square when it's not even square? I don't know. Was <laughs> on one of those uh, as Broadway sliced through. It was on one of those little diagonal pieces that were kind of left over. But then they closed Broadway, so it's the full block now. But it's mm -hmm. just it's just you still have Greeley Square, which is this little green oasis with tables and stuff. And then the avenue is next to it, which is closed to cars. So it's got tables and stuff on it, too. Mm -hmm. So Greeley Square is still actually the same little triangular park. <laughs> but it's, you know, broader now because that patch of road is closed next to it. Good evening, Chris. Hello, guys. Hey. Setting well, like everything up. <laughs> He's setting us setting up. Do -do 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 -do. Maybe, Jared, let's see if we can blind Chris. Do the all right. We discovered this tonight. Doctor Strange, uh -oh. Chris, look up, Chris. What are you doing? Chris. He's looking down. <laughs> what the hell? What the hell? A... That's the new one we discovered wow. when you make the Doctor Strange hands. Wow. <laughs> There's no end powers. <laughs> Doctor Strange hands. Chris, Chris all, all, uh, almost became the Blitz. <laughs> he missed it. I did. <laughs> yeah. And you're supposed to say, oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it's from How I Met Your Mother. It's the yeah. Jerry Garcia, the the episode with a uh, Jerry Garcia. Is that the the guy's name? The the one who was also in Lost. The fat oh. guy from Lost. Oh, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is his name the same as the Grateful Dead guy? I don't know what his real uh, name. Is. I have no idea. No, it isn't. Here's the first comic I got this week. Penthouse Comics issue two. By the way, I really don't like this cover. It's just bland. I mean, can you make like a blander pinup cover than this? From a guy called um, Joe D. Wait, it, it, isn't that? Isn't that a? Who did this cover? Contribute cover artist is this uh, Leslie Lyrix Lee? Who? I don't know. L I is her last, or his or her last name, and it's uh, Leslie first name, and then in quotes. L E I R I X Lyrics Lee. <laughs> one of one of the cover artists is Big Icky. That's just kind of bland, generic pinup woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and with bland, generic background. Looks like I, a Top Cow cover from 1997. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, I like pinup art. I'm, I like butts. But this one just does nothing for me. Mm -hmm. Just kind of like, eh, we need we need a pinup cover. Here you go. Uh -huh. So I got to say, look, I wish, you know, being a, it's on my poll list, I don't get to pick my cover. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, you know, the number one, the main cover. I'm like, ah. Uh, in, and, the UK, and, in the United Kingdom, they would call that uh, page three in the Daily Mirror. <laughs> and uh, guess how many copies issue number one sold? How many do you think? Because I would have never get. I, I had no. I, I would have no idea. They give the number here. How many? Um, how many copies? It's a. Uh, how much is this? Ten dollar issue number one penthouse comics. Had lots of covers. Mm -hmm. Magazine size. So that would probably make it be lower. 
And I think this is who's their distributor? Because I mentioned their this is Behemoth Comics or the I guess Diamond is the only one distributing in because it says uh, distributor Diamond. Let's see. Would you think it's higher or lower than 50,000 copies? For number one? For number one. I guess it could be higher. higher. Nope, it's lower. Oh, really? God. Yep. So number two selling what? A thousand? <laughs> it says uh, Pet launched over 30,000 copies sold. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if that number is good or bad. For $10 magazine. For a $10 magazine, I guess that's pretty good. And it says that um, obviously by the time this is printed, we'll already have the final print numbers for this issue. But I can say writing this, things are looking extremely positive. 25,000 plus copies. Um, truthfully, we're so excited to bring so many readers these stories. I gotta say that if they can sell 25,000 copies of the second issue, I think they're in pretty good shape. Let's hope that it, they can. <laughs> but I enjoy, once again, we it, it, it's all European comics. Here is the lineup. I can't even read. The dead all have the same skin. John by, by Jean David Jean Morvan and yeah. Germain and Ramusp and Mauro Vargas. That's probably Brazilian. Yeah. I spit on your grave by Jean David Mo Morvan, Ray Macute, Rafael Ortiz. Miss October by St Stefan Deberg and Alain Quere. The Dream by Jean Dufault and Guillaume March. Two four nice, gun crazy by Steve D and Jeff. In spite of the, they are French with those names. <laughs> yeah. Fuck Mary Kill by Paranoid Android photo photography. Oh, yeah, that's the and photograph one. Yeah, then there's <laughs> then there's next. They, ah, okay. give, they actually give you a um, photo layout. Okay. There's some nudity that happens in the later pages, but I guess in the oh. tradition of Penthouse, I wanted to throw a naked lady in there. Yeah, Tit Goblin said the cover looked AI, but I bet those are AI. <laughs> no, that's an actual, oh, actual photographs, it said. Yeah, I know it's not. The cover looks AI because AI is so good at technique. And this is all about technique. There's Wilson. You know, the AI can copy this technique easily because AI is very good at this sort of uh, airbrush technique. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, and it looks AI because it's so, such a generic cover. There's nothing particular. It's like, oh, we need big blonde hair. We need to bring a little coy with her finger in her mouth. We, and you know, a thought went through my head. I wish I could find this poster. Um I had a Boris Vallejo poster back when I was in college in the 80s. A woman with a dragon in her butt. And boy, <laughs> could Boris Vallejo paint a butt. Yeah. So I was looking at this one and goes, eh, it's a butt, but it's no Boris Vallejo butt. <laughs> but the issue itself is pretty good. We get one new story and a continuation of the other stories that were in issue one. Some... <laughs> This is Super White Man, who is a racist going around killing people. He does killing minorities. What what's the name of this story? Uh, Gun Crazy. And they give a nice recap of what happened in the first part of the story. So I gotta say the recaps were well well written. And I like that. I I like this because I get to read the European stuff that I never see, and I think <laughs> they're gonna pr pr print them as individual albums. I'm not sure because they they got um in their next stuff. What's next from Pentan 
Adam is an 88 page thriller set in France. And here's like a, you know, graphic album version of it. So I'm like, are they going to publish them this way too? Yeah. Neville, Sapin, and Duty. Okay, so the magazine covers the 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 production costs. Yeah, I don't. There's another and one, you, and then you put out the album. Although they do have to, since those are European, they they there's always royalties involved. Right, right. There's three more, of, but I'm like they must be publishing them like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they just said those are the ones that are coming into Penthouse Comics next. So, and it explains what they are. Gay Jin, a thriller, uh, Jean David Marvan again, and by Damien Henseval, 2D in parentheses. I guess 2D is his signature. I don't know. Story and art, uh, Manalo, C A R O T. That's the fall of Dante. Carat, carrot. Hot Charlotte, story by Ennio Ekiba and Vincenzo Luria, art by Vincenzo Cucca, C U C C A. <laughs> Might as well put, put it on and I'll read it, okay? Are <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to figure out what they're saying? Here, look, I'll show you. There are the All names right. down there. Okay. There are the names down there. Okay, so the first Jean David Morvan, Damien Ansval. Why he calls himself 2D, I don't know. <laughs> so the other one is by Manolo Car. Car it might maybe Caro or Caro. Let me check. Let me just. Check. And the other one is by Enio Ecuba, Vincenzo Lauria, and Vincenzo Cuca. With colors by Maria Cristina Federico. There we go. That's what they're supposed to sound like. Yes. <laughs> you don't know that, that, that Latin languages are, are, have very easy vowels. Uh -huh. And for some reason, the native English speakers always want to mangle the vowels like they were mangled in English. Ah, uh, yep. The great vowel shift of the 15th century ruined English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just watching a TikTok that was saying... Uh... English is really just mangled French. <laughs> that's uh, that's not true. It's mangled. That's not one hundred percent. Now he wasn't saying that was one hundred percent true either. But there's a lot mm. of French words that came over to English because of that. Yeah, but that's not what mangled the English. It was, <laughs> it was a, an overreaction by the Saxon speakers against ah. the uh, against the, the 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 French Norman influence on uh, on the language, and by doing the vowel shift, uh, they actually cut ties with the way that. Old, the, the, that old Frisian was spoken. Old Frisian being a, a Dutch local language. I was I was listening to something uh, I can't remember what, or reading it, where they were saying um, American English is closer. American English, <laughs> stay away is from me. To what English sounded like. At America's founding, than English English, because there was a big shift in English English. I don't remember when. Mm -hmm. Sometime in the 1800s, English English had a big shift in it that American English never did. Yeah, although, from what I understand, American English is a northern redneck uh, from northern rednecks in northern England. <laughs> in England, it's the northerners who are rednecks. <laughs> in the south, they're hillbillies. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can, so you think you, you know how, how people say that? Oh, it's just the that English sounds intelligence. Yeah, it sounds intelligent. But when you look at action, but the that's mi middle uh, middle English. That that, that is. Um, not middle, um, middle England, oh, English, okay. middle earth. And then, <laughs> and then they have the redneck accent from the North and the hillbilly accent from the South, <laughs> which is Cornish. <laughs> uh, we have to show Wilson what we discovered. Dr. Strange. 
a nice. new hand gesture. <laughs> I couldn't get any of mine to work. You have sent the uh, yeah. that link, and it looks like that link only works for like laptops and stuff ah. like that. It or maybe you didn't new get enough any something? of that ability on my. Maybe it could very well be possible that my computer is not advanced yeah, enough like to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. What are you working on tonight, Chris? A big commission. Big commission? How big? 24 yeah, by 36? I, I think I told you. It's, it's still this one. Okay. Marvel Universe Handbook. All right. Yeah. It's a lot. So a, a lot, lot of characters, characters and a lot of pages. A lot of pages? Are you doing the whole book? No, I'm not doing the interiors, but I'm doing was, all the covers. Oh, you, oh, you're doing 15th. You're doing all the covers to the uh, Marvel Handbook. Yeah, that's the commission. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I remember you doing them. I don't. Just, I just didn't realize it was all of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wow, that's, that that is a lot. <laughs> 15 well, inches better, front they, and back cover. Yeah. Well, they better be paying you top dollar for that. Yeah. Or at least middle dollar. Um, <laughs> or at least in no dollars. <laughs> <laughs> or you, you, okay. you could do it. But first, you could do an art, an art exhibit with them and charge people to, to get in. Yeah. Boy, I have to say, thank goodness for Photoshop actions. <laughs> Yeah. Reminds, speaking of doing a lot of things, I decided that I wanted to turn as much of my art into prints as possible. And my um, dreams of things covers that I show off every week on what I what I do with those is because, you know, they're done in ink and marker. But first I print the logos on a board you know, like the logos go on a blank board and then I work on that board so I don't have to do any of the logos. So the, the logos are on the final piece because I like the way that looks. But after I scan them in and now I'm going to make prints out of them, I have to sort of replace the logos with digital ones just so it prints out better. So I have to like open up the document, copy the logo, put it in there get it in the right spot, make some adjustments to the color, put the, I have to redo the numbers in month two that I have in there. Uh, but I managed to get almost all of it to be automated in Photoshop action. So it takes like a 10 minute project and cuts it down to about a three minute project, which saves a lot of time over 200 covers. But I was just like doing it. To, and it took me about a half an hour. I don't know if you, how many Photoshop actions you guys have done. It just records what you do. And then you could hit a button and it plays and it runs it back on other stuff. It's a macro. I, I learned it by watching you. <laughs> so it took me about half an hour to, to get <laughs> that up. Because there's a lot of trial error. Because you go, okay, I go, oh, that isn't right. Okay, let me fix that part. Okay, okay. Oh, that isn't right. Let me fix that part. Okay, okay. So it's like you get a quarter of it done, then 50% of it done, then 75% of it done, then 100% of it done. Then you realize you skipped a step, so you're back to 25. But you put that in and you're right back to 75. So I was like, it takes a while to figure out multiple steps. But now that I got it done, I'm just like, do, 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 do. all right, almost done. Move a couple things around, I'm good. Do, 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 do. And I was like, wow, Photoshop actions are so good when you have to do repetitive things. I have an older it version of Photoshop. It doesn't have sound effects in it. <laughs> <laughs> all, this, all this remind me of a all this remind me of a uh, reminded me of a story I read about Alex Ross in, in Wizard. Because mm -hmm. uh, a guy uh a guy sent a letter which was published in the um, in the letter section in Wizard. Hey, can you guys hook me up with Alex Ross? I want to hire him to paint a, a mural of a scene from Kingdom Come uh, in my bedroom wall. And yeah. if he comes, my my wife will make will will, will make him a, a, a <laughs> her world famous meatloaf. <laughs> so so the the guy the guys from Wizard called Alex Ross and Alex Ross answered. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. I really can't do can't do that. If I did, if I actually did that, I'd, I'd always be getting hired to paint murals on everybody's houses, and then that would, and then I would be tasting every uh, every <laughs> wife's meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw. Um, I think it was a new cover by Alex Ross, and, and you know, sometimes immediately some criticism jumps into your head, and I'm like, I can't write that here. Everyone's admiring it because it was. Um, it was a picture of an Alex Ross painting of Mr. Fantastic and like a bunch of, I don't know, some kind of creatures biting him. And it's like his face was, his face skin was all stretched out. And I was like, why aren't his teeth stretching? Why aren't his skull stretching? How come his bones aren't stretching just his skin is? <laughs> but I'm like, I, I can't. It was a nice looking piece, but I was like, that's the first thought that got me into my head. I'm like, his whole body stretches, not just his skin and muscles. <laughs> Let's see, what is Tit Goblin saying here? Hey, Wilson, I'm downsizing, getting rid of 90% of Y collections. Is vintage Godzilla stuff hot these days or am I uh, splitting? Spitting on a stack of young blood number ones. I think is vintage Godzilla stuff hot. It it is. Uh, the Marvel stuff seems to be what people are trying to get. Just because they sat in the dollar bins for so long, people right. never paid attention to them. But lately, you know, people want to collect stuff. Godzilla has become the hot item to collect older issues, and the Marvel ones seem to be the hot ones, because that's the first set of Godzilla books uh, ever really published. There's only, I think, 19 issues in total. It hasn't been in reprints. Only recently, they're going back to print with stuff. So I'm thinking it's just hot now because Godzilla is the hot item. I just saw that the... Um... Micronauts Masterworks came now. The Micronauts uh, Omnibus came out this week, the first one. So they finally got that in print again. Right. A lot of people were excited. I was like, you know what? Despite the fact that I bought all the Micronauts issues right off the stands, volumes one, two, and three, I'm okay never reading it again. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> it was would only want to okay read. I was interested in it only because I wasn't reading Micronauts and because it is Michael Golden artwork. Oh, yeah. If it wasn't, if it wasn't Michael Golden artwork, I don't think I would. Well, I guess it would depend on whose artwork would have been. Right. But um, it, I have no connection to it. Uh, right. I may have an issue or two somewhere along the line, but it, I am not rushing out to get it kind of a thing. I am right. interested in it only because of golden artwork. I um I heard someone describe it and I thought this was interesting that uh you get to see Michael Golden turn into Michael Golden before your eyes from issues right. one to twelve. Because I I read the um facsimile edition of issue one came out last year I think and I got that and it really wasn't particularly good Michael Golden. So I'm guessing he got, even though I, I, have, I haven't seen the issues in years, I used to have them. He got better and better from issue one to 12, I imagine. And it had some nice covers. Yeah, because yeah, Michael wasn't like, uh, wasn't reading comics. He kind of stumbled into comic book Shit. illustration. So for him, he was learning on the go. And I think right. he really studied more once he was already in it. Yeah. Good evening, sleepy reader. And speaking of names I don't know how to pronounce, even though I looked up on YouTube and they told me how to pronounce it, and Paolo told me how to pronounce it, um, I read this this week with our Turkish name. Özge <laughs> Samanchi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more of an E than an O, I think they said on YouTube. But uh, I, I, find, I, I read this. This is one of my mocha purchases. And I sat down and read it. Jackie gets all the facsimiles, but none of the omnibuses. I think I haven't gotten any facsimiles in a little while. 
just because they're into a lot of stuff now, like 80s stuff that I don't care about, and they've gotten even more expensive. You know, they're like five bucks a facsimile now, and I'm just like, no thanks. But this is uh, Ozgi, Ezgi. Uh, I, I met her at Mocha and bought this from her. Let me show you a little of the art. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It's a story. There's some of the artwork. It takes place in the 90s. And it's just, she described it to me as a murder mystery. But it's not quite that. Though there is a murder mystery, you know, sort of plot in it too. Uh, but I think that's her way of, you know, selling it to fans or whatever. It's an, it's, an e it's easier to describe it as a murder mystery than whatever it is, which is the story of these um, two young college-age women who live in Istanbul, I think it is, during the 90s and are going to school. And it's about their friendship. It's about their school life. It's about their um, despair, I guess it would be. There's a little bit of despair in the air because Turkey wasn't in... Um, I th if I remember Turkey in the 90s, it was going from secular to more religious. Uh, and it, and there was always this, you know, there's a certain amount of corruption they run into, too. And neither of them is particularly rich. So they're struggling with what they're going to do with their lives, this and that, how to, how to go about things. And meanwhile, they, they're they also scuba divers. So they, they scuba dive in the Bosphorus. And it's also their way around. They explain that uh, the beaches were for men. Women weren't allowed to go on the beaches. Um, but them going scuba diving was kind of a way around that they could go scuba diving. Um, so that's one of the things they do. Meanwhile, they're down there scuba diving and a car comes into the crashes into the river or whatever the Bosphorus is. I, I don't even know what, is it, what do you call something that connects the Mediterranean and the Black Sea? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it'd be called. I just anyway, um, and and it's a friend of their, not a friend. It's somebody they recognize from their college, and she ends up they they manage to get her out, but she drowns. Uh, and then they get caught up in sort of it, it's the plot really is kind of complex but simple. Because it's just like one thing going on at the time, but there's a lot of pages. They uh, they get they get talked to by the police, and meanwhile, like an ex policeman who's now a politician was talking, wanted to talk to him, and he's like I said, there's a lot of corrupt polit politicians, so they don't want anything to do with him. But then he hires one of the girls to tutor his son. Meanwhile, he finds out he he. A thief steals a safe and and loses it in the in the Bosphorus too, the river, the whatever it's called, whatever that body of water is called. Um, so he hires them to scuba dive to get it out, and they're like, "Do we really want to get it out?" And they kind of draw out the process where they're going down there and pretending they can't find it, even though they found it, just so he pays them more. And, and meanwhile, there's like another subplot going on where our main character is this redheaded girl here. And this other, her friend, the black haired girl is quite beautiful. So you get the experience of her being friends with somebody who's quite beautiful while she's kind of not. So she's always kind of like, ah, everybody wants to talk to her so they can meet her friend. Uh, and her friends, you know, so pretty that they someone hires her to be a stewardess too so she so it was like there's all this stuff going it's one of these occasionally i get a comic where um i know in the future i can just pick it up and read any few pages and it'll be interesting and every few pages is sort of like there's different things going on i mean it holds together all together of course but i can just pick it up and read a few pages and go oh isn't that interesting Oh, you know, here, here they are at a college party. 
Uh, really enjoyed it. It was very good. Let's see how many pages was it? 279 pages. So, you know, it was pretty pretty big book. And a lot, especially at the beginning, there was a lot of stuff going on. There they are trying to rescue the girl from the car. And the girl's sister eventually shows up and all sorts of, there's all sorts of stuff. And they, they also, the college is so poor that they don't have hot water except for every now and then. And quite often there's just birds living in the bathroom. They go in the bathroom and there's just birds there. And there's usually not flowing water at all in the bathroom. So things are a mess. So Turkey was a mess in the 90s. I'm not sure it's not a mess now. But I remember in the 90s reading about what a mess it, a bit, it was a bit of a mess. And this takes place during those times. Okay. Considering their president uh, figured out a way to make himself president for life without any, anyone, without any, not, not noticing. Everyone noticed, but uh, yeah. they don't mind. Without anyone assassinating him or pro, yeah. So, but good book, Evil Eyes, uh, Evil Eyes See. I'm glad. I, do they call us? Is it the Bosphorus Strait? Is that it? Let me see. I there was a little map know. in here. Just says Bosphorus here. Yeah, the Bos It's the Bosphorus and the the Dardanelles. Right, right. The, the Dardanelles. They definitely call a strait. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the. Phosphorus connects the Black Sea, the Sea of Marmara, Marmara and then the Sea this, of Marmara connects to the Mediterranean. Yeah, no, the Sea of Marmara is between the two straits. Right. Turkey is not allowed to shut down the, the straits for, for international traffic. Right. International marine traffic. But they do control it. Yes. Just if they shut it down, that'll start a war, so they don't. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a map here that shows us where it takes place in Istanbul, not Constantinople. <laughs> Istanbul, uncivilized books, but good stuff. Oh, look, there's there's a bunch of names. Let's see if Paolo can get the for her roommates. Okay. Uh, let's see if I. Okay, so Jada, Alvin, Feliz. I'm not sure. Feliz. I'm not sure if it's Feliz or Feliz. Uh, Yuldem, uh, Nalan, Uzlem, Yeshim. That first one is Jada. Yeah. The C is a J. Yeah, sound. If it, uh -huh. See, I never would have got that. <laughs> if it's an E or an A, yeah. Ah. Up and there's some some old Roman uh, Constantinople pillars, mm -hmm. where that they, they said the heads were always on their side or upside down, holding up a big vaulted roof that they were at. And they were pondering why the heads were always on their side or upside down. But good stuff. Here's a here's a here's a history question um, that I was discussing on TikTok today because I never thought of it before. Oh, what is the name of that? Kayahotek? or is that the the really old city that's in Turkey? Go back, go back, Tepe. No, no, not that. It's 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 a couple. That those are the shrine. Go back, Tepe. It's um, C A T. And a bunch. I just looked it up. Let me see if I can find it. It's it. It was like the oldest. It's one of the oldest cities, uh, and they found Gobleck Gobleckly Tepe. Oh, there it is. It's uh, Katahoyuk. Hmm. Yeah, let me. There's a lot of accents on this one. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Uh, I, I've heard of. I've heard it pronounced right. I just can't pronounce it right. Let me put it here. There we go. Okay, so 
jittily. But anyway, that's that's the old city. And this woman on TikTok was who I think is some kind of archaeologist, uh was discussing the city. And it's all I think it's um it's like eleven thousand years old. Mm. Uh and it was and it's often referred to as the first city, except a lot of archaeologists don't consider it a city for whatever their definition of city. Oh, because it had no it's not considered a city because it had no ruler. It was still in the day and age where there were no it was no power structure. But it, it's the the one, I don't know if you've ever seen it where um all the buildings are like side by side and the entrances are in the roof. So that like the streets were walking on the roofs. Hmm. And um, this is, and it's um, like um, Gedekli Tepe. It was like, I think they said Gedekli uh, Tepe went out of use like a thousand to two thousand years before this city. Yeah. Uh, so this was the first city of like settled farmers. Mm -hmm. And there, there was an artist rendition of the city at its height. And I looked at it, and the first thing, and and there was like three or four fields next that, to the city. Pretty, pretty. Tremendous and I went, premise. you know what? Only three seats. That's nowhere. There. That's not enough fun. And and I and it's struck. And I think the city like said at its height had seven thousand residents. And I, and I asked this woman, I'm like, you know, where were the farms? Because those those fields are not feeding seven thousand people. And I was wondering that, like. Did some of the seven thousand people have to commute to a farm? How how big would a farm would farmland have to be to feed seven thousand people? Because in this artist rendition, there was clearly not enough farmland <laughs> to feed mm. seven thousand people. And I tried looking up how big Neolithic farms were, and nowhere could I find any data on big a neolithic farm it was they they always mention and all the history of agriculture stuff no one ever says how big yeah. the farms were mm -hmm. and, and i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure they they know i think yeah, that yeah. in industry in the industrial area you need four times the area that the population takes up yeah if they were farming the way that we farm now we're only discovering that like the Amazon might have actually been oh, yeah. a living farm, right? The, in a completely. different format where things are grown together instead of in the, fields, so that the, might actually take up less space. The the forests of North America will, were all farmed, but not how we think of. They planted all these sim, symbiotic plants near each other that grew right. and they could eat from. So it was a completely different type of farming. But and we're talking about the, the, the fields it. farming. You need yeah, big right. fields, so but anyway, something I, like ten something like ten thousand years ago, uh, the climate in in southern Anatolia would be uh, much closer to what you find nowadays in Germany okay. in, ter in terms of vegetation. So you probably can have the the. You, you can you can have high yield you could probably have high yield crops at the time even with a with a limited with limited tools and limited techniques because the the weather was there for it because at the the sahara desert had already taken back the most of northern africa at the time but i think in southern anatolia was, was still a very 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 good for a for farming at the at the time well, because the the ice had not receded in a, in northern europe completely yeah i i i eventually found a picture of the site as it is today mm -hmm. and there's farmland as far as the eye can see yeah the mountains are way further in the distance in the picture i found today than in the artist rendering of the buildings as they were then i was like okay that makes more sense that but but I but but I still wonder are there like um are there you know are there guys who their farm is a five minute walk that way and there are other guys who their farm is an hour walk that way 
Yeah, He's but that's a, not a that wasn't a problem back then. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was just I just never heard that addressed. I was like, did you have if you were in this you know town of seven thousand people? Right, but you're were, you're thinking in terms of a nine to five job. Yeah, not even not, nine, but I'm just saying. Um, how far? How much land did it take? How much? Like of those seven thousand people, probably most of them, or at least you know half of them, have to tend the land. In which land did you tend? The land that's right close there, or did somebody have to walk an hour to tend the land? I have no idea. I've never heard it addressed. I think that if you woke up when the when the sun rose and you managed to get to your workplace. Uh, before noon, that would not be considered too far away. Yeah, I, I just have no idea. I just, I've never thought about it before this afternoon. Well, I, well, look, my dad used to used to have to walk four miles to go to school. Right. He actually did. It's yeah. it's not one of those things. Oh, back in my day, not we one had of those to stories. No, yeah, did. Yeah, no, that was actually real. I went to the place where my where my dad grew up, uh, and you did have to. I had they had no they had no electricity in in the 1950s. In in junior in junior high, I have I have how many miles did I have to walk to school? Somewhere between two and four. I'd have to actually measure it, but that we had we had, it's all suburban, but we had, well, hold on. <laughs> it may have been three. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uphill, yeah, uphill <laughs> both ways. Yeah. Look, yeah, I got cool. umlauts. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, you you can reshape the way you the way you pronounce your own name. How do you <laughs> want to pronounce your own name? <laughs> My name is English, so we'd probably have to go to some old English pronunciation. Tit Goblin says a buddy of mine went out with a wealthy Turkish woman at university days. She left abruptly because Newfoundland is so decrepit. Rejected Newfoundland to go back to busted, jacked up Turkey. <laughs> I'm sure she uh, was. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I always had the impression that if you weren't born there, Newfoundland was an, had to be an acquired taste. <laughs> Although I saw the the episode on on, on the Food Network, uh, and the food looks nice. Mm -hmm. So I probably I probably wouldn't mind living there if it wasn't for the cold. But but I'm definitely gonna revisit this one from time to time just because, like I said, it's one of those books I think I can just read a few page, pick up and read a few pages of, and have mm -hmm. fun. Enjoy yeah, it's it. like a soap opera. Yeah, see new things in it. There are some books, there are some comics I can do that with. And you went to the comic shop this week, uh, Wilson. Yes, I went yesterday. I didn't get to read any of the books yet, but I did pick up a few. Well, show us one. See. All right. So uh, from my... <laughs> I almost had the old habit of saying from my bundles, but it wasn't because I paid for these. <laughs> from my subscriptions... That's what uh, we call them in Marvel, bundles. Bundles. So from my subscription is uh, Spider-Boy, issue number six. So let me take this out of the bag so we can see the cover. Spider Boy. Decent cover. Yep. There's, there's a bit of storytelling there. He's captured. Yeah. It's going to be worked on. And I also picked up a copy of Superman issue number 13. Almost okay. looks like a double cover. So it, it may be where we huh. There may be a double cover, but um, I don't know if it connects to anything. Like so it might Supergirl connect to next, next issue, you mean? Maybe. Or one, or against maybe one of the other Superman titles. Yeah, or yeah. that was the decision that was made for this particular cover. Yeah, it does look like it should be a connecting cover because it splits right, right in the middle. Yes. So right, right on that spot. So I would imagine... There must be a connecting cover to it somewhere else. UPCs are getting smaller and smaller. I guess that yeah. UPC technology is improved. Yeah, here's here's the Marvel one with that one. And yeah. all you need is those lines. Here's right. another thing, too, I found out about UPCs. They don't necessarily always have to be uh, white background. 
Right, you right. As they, long as it's a lighter color. They, they have to be below it. that 50% threshold. So it can, because it's, it's uh, the laser only sees the two colors, black and white. Exactly. So a, uh, as long as you're below that 50% threshold, that color turns to white. Yep. And as long as, uh, and, and what the barcode, from what I understand, is being read, it's not necessarily the black part, it's the white part. Ah. that's being read I, I, for the life of me i can't remember where i got that information it was <laughs> one of those it was from one of those how it's made episodes about right. like the creation of barcodes and how yeah. we're supposed to make things easier how it's made it on the science channel yep <laughs> oh i have to show you something i actually got an action figure this week oh what did you pick up <sighs> Ah, classic Iron Man. And I picked him up, got him for, I think, uh, with tax, was 22 bucks on eBay. And now I'm going to pay price. I'm going to, since he's this all gray color, I think that'll take paint well. And I can make art Iron Man. There you go, pop art Iron Man. Yeah, <laughs> pop art Iron Man. He can go with my... um. Funko Pops. I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with him yet, but I have some. I was even thinking about doing a live painting of him, but uh, we'll see about that. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. Oh, yeah, picked that up. Like I said, 22 bucks. I don't usually buy um, at too many action figures, but I was inspired by the gray. <laughs> I was like, I want to paint that gray Iron Man. And he stands they, really well with these big boots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Nice, Undead Quinn. How you doing? Iron Art Man. Can't wait to see it. Cool. <laughs> Jared Art Iron Man is going to be totally awesome. Art Wasps. <laughs> Change him into Big Guy and Rusty. <laughs> oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't have the patience to like paint something to be something else <laughs> i i just want to paint them however it comes out however whatever crazy patterns i can come up with like to paint them to like like big guy and rusty i just i would i just wouldn't have the patience for that it's weird what you what you have the patience for and what you don't oh let's see what else did i get this week Oh, I have to show you this first issue. Love Me. A Romance Story by Francesco Perillo, Stefano Cardicelli, Lorenzo Scaramella. You know, this might be made in Italy. And Buddy Boudon, he's not in that same spot. But in case you don't recognize that artist's name, he's the one who gave us the flamingos. Uh. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> nice artwork, too. In case you don't remember, I pulled, I pulled them out. Don't Spit in the Wind was the book I bought where there were random flamingos standing around in this last issue. That's Why did neat. I think the flamingos were on like an older comic book? Nope. Huh. Where are they now? They're on a new comic book. There they are. There's some random flamingos. Oh, yeah. okay. For no reason, sitting around watching the explosion. They show up a couple more times, I think. Where are they? I think because we put those flamingos on so many older comics, I <laughs> automatically, in my head, thought they came from like a 1950s book. The very last page of the series just has the flamingos flying with the spaceship. For no particular reason. But now, that this one was pretty good. Like I said, uh, this one I think he wrote himself, Stefano Cardicelli. This one he's working with a writer. And it's the story of this robot. You know, there's the robot again right there, that big potato-looking robot 
who lives, he's a cab driver and lives in this world where everybody hates robots. And he picks up this one woman um, who's really nice to him and he falls in love with her. Then, of course, uh, he, she, on the last page, we find out that she stands him up on a date they were having. So, so now we get sad robot at the very end. So I don't know where what this where this story's going. This this story could be a done in one itself. Um, matter of fact, nope, says to be continued. Uh, this is a five dollar book, and it was well worth the five dollars. That won't uh, be the be the same with a couple other books like that. <laughs> But yeah, Stefano Cardicelli is back. The guy who gave us our flamingos. <laughs> oh, hold on. Random flamingos flying in this shot. <laughs> I think that's what that's where we came because I noticed in this last issue there were flamingos all over it. Amazing Fantasy 15. Wilson. Odd. I thought there was a dolphin on the cover. I remember a dolphin. <laughs> That's not the original cover. The original cover had a dolphin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's a reprint without a dolphin. So the books that I picked up off the rack are uh, The Spectacular Spider-Men, issue number two. Okay. Did you get issue number one? I think I did. I have to look through my pile. <laughs> double check. I have to double check. Uh, Superman, the Metal Curtain 78. So it's issue number six. Place You've been Christmas buying that three. one regularly? Yes, I've been picking them up. Uh, haven't been reading them all, but I'm picking them up. And I've been enjoying the artwork. Um, yeah. Because it, it, to me, it just it gives me that feel of uh, the movie's continuity so right. i really enjoy it i still got to try the batman 89 ones to see if they're just as good uh because i hear good things about them so as a way to bring metallo into the series uh the suit was created by the american government but it was stolen by the russians ah. so that's basically how they're adding the a another comic book element into the story if the story was to continue yep so here's a beautiful shot there yeah then i picked up the facsimile of crisis issue number one okay they had multiple types of covers uh or at least uh two other covers uh this one has like this dull uh a dull gold coloring to it mm -hmm. and then they had like a full chrome cover but i got just okay. the regular the ish self. what's the price on that 3.99 3.99 that's not bad that's a and it's at least it's a normal comic price right and the Have paper ever... is very newsprinty ish looking so it's, it's a matte feel to it so yeah. it's a matte and it's it, an and uncoated it paper feel to it completely uncoded and it it feels like the, the comic book of the time period right Let's see tit goblin Four says page. the batman 89 mine does feel like a continuation of the movies it's okay all right cool nice and then last but not least is a book that i picked up just because of the cover alone uh dudley dalson and the forever machine Okay. Is issue number one, Dark, Dark Horse. Horse. It had they had multiple covers. I don't uh, think I saw that one. It was the same cover, but they had multiple things on it. Like this one has right. a nice little shiny gold to just the logo. Okay. And is it like, a, is it a thicker cover? Uh the cover, yeah. It's, it's I haven't picked up a Dark Horse book in a while. But Dark Horse usually has really th they they have self covered stuff with really thin paper, so I yeah the, I, paper, the but not all paper is thin but cover the cover stock has a bit of a weight to it. Okay, that's good because like like I said, I know, 
Sometimes I pick up a Dark Horse book. I'm like, ooh, I'm not buying this. <laughs> and the interiors is by Jamal Eigel. Okay, uh, I did see that one. I've never seen his name. Yeah, so it looks good. I, I know nothing about it yet. And Scott Snyder is the writer. Cool. Yep. So, again, I just picked it up just for the cover alone. It was like, all right, let me give it a try as an issue number one. And uh, I, if anything, I know I'll have good artwork. Don't know about the story. Yeah. Nice. So was that four comics you picked up this week? So that was uh, four comics off the rack and okay. then two comics that were from my pull list. Pull list. Okay. So six, six That's six a good week, six comics. Yeah, it's not a bad week. That my. I could have definitely have grabbed more stuff, but uh, most of it was just like, Oh, those are some new Marvel covers, but nothing jumped out of me yeah. cover wise. And is it? I, I noticed this week, except for Spawn, I think it was. Um, I had a ten dollar Penthouse comics, and all my other comics were five dollars. I was like, "Whoa, that uh, like this." Um, Love Me was five dollars. Uh, see, what else did I get? I picked this one up uh, off the stand. I picked this one up. This is a, I um, wasn't on my pull list. And this is a $4 one. And I swear I one of the reasons I bought it was only a $4 one. <laughs> Silicon Bandits. It's by Magma Comics, who are the same ones that I bought last week. That one that was super gory, the something of necromancy, which I enjoyed. Uh, same company. Um, except this one is who does this one? Oh, oh we got to get Paolo in on this again. Jason Starr, I can get. Yeah, uh, Dalibor Talajic and Stepan Bartolic. So those, that's those that's our artist and colorist there. Mm -hmm. um, nice job. This one is about to, takes place in the future. Let me show you a little of the art. Takes place in the future. You can see this husband and wife team are doing a corporate um, corporate announcement. They just perfect invented and perfected this latest model Android. Who they have to have translucent skin legally. And they're mostly going to be sold to, um, as like the first androids that are super strong and super smart. And they're mostly going to be sold to military and security. But you can all, they want to make it affordable so everybody can have an android in their house. Uh, and her husband is kind of a little, um, uh, he's not as into it as she is. She she's into these presentations, these corporate presentations and everything. They're working for some trillionaire. And he's kind of like, eh, do we really want to be making these androids? It doesn't seem she's like, come on, this is our life's work. Of course, the twist in the plot is um their boss, he's the trillionaire, <laughs> now decides to <laughs> fire them. Because he can now put these new super smart androids to work building new androids. And uh, the boss is even like, you made all these androids that are going to put people out of jobs. You think they weren't going to put you out of a job, too? <laughs> so, of course, there's a little current AI thing going there. And then so she, of course, she was, you know, Miss Corporate Gung Ho. So she's all pissed off. But then her husband is like, don't worry. I kind of planned for this a little. We're going to see what we can do. And it turns out he secretly had... Four androids built, and they're going to help them take down this trillionaire somehow. I don't know. They have some sort of, he has some sort of plan. I don't know what it is. But he also made two of the androids look like her dead parents. So that was a, he's like, that's a little weird. That's a little weird. He's like, yeah, it's my yeah. tribute to them. And they're like, oh, do you want us to not? We can change our looks. Um. So it it was a good first issue. I'm I'm probably I'm gonna get more of this one. It was definitely cool. Silicon Bandits. Oh, the principles of necromancy. That's the one I had last week. Uh, 
So there's some covers to it. That's there's some more covers to the Silicon Bandit. So, but this is the yeah, this is the main cover one one one. But I liked it. Those are two good comics from whoever Magma Comics is. Let's see, where are they? Morgan Hat Magma. Oh, ooh. San Diego, California. San Diego. The Silicon Bandits is copyright Jason Starr and Dalibor Talijic. 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 So the J is pronounced. Yeah, the, the J is pronounced like a Y. The C is pronounced T, but if it has an accent, it's pronounced Ch. Man, growing up here in the U.S., I'm like the C is pronounced a Y. What the? What the? Huh? No, the J is pronounced like a Y. The C is pronounced like a T. Talijic. 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 Okay, so I'll. I, I just have, you know, my grasp of languages obviously isn't great. It's like I learned this stuff and then half an hour <laughs> later, it's just out of my head. <laughs> but yeah, good. I'm definitely putting a second issue on my poll list and we'll see maybe the, the whole thing. But yeah, enjoyed it a lot. The Penthouse Comics was a bore to read. I liked it. Is that... <laughs> That kind of book. I, I like the penthouse, but I like that. I mean, I mean, I can I, I can understand, you know, Americans don't oh I don't know if you're American, but Americans don't always like that sort of European style of slowly build it's it's not you know American especially if you break it, if you break up a, a European graphic novel into chapters, yeah, they're not chapters, right? They just kind of end, but I expect that. Like the, there was one I have to show hold on. Charity Palo's worst pupil. <laughs> <laughs> Why you no learn? I mean, I know that their graphic novels broken up. So that, like this, where, where is it? This one here. Um, he manages. He gets this uh, chick in bed. Then it and where is it? Come on. It ends in the middle of a sex scene <laughs> with him just making his O face. Where'd it go? Well, it is a penthouse comic. True. Here we go. It's like, <laughs> I got to show you this. Me, it ends in the middle of a sex scene in the car, and that's the, like the last panel of the story right there. It's yep. just next page is just next story. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I can see how if I mean I expect it because I yeah. know where it so but if it's like if you're not used to that sort if, you, if you're not expecting it you're gonna go what yeah because in 2000 AD there, there are storylines but uh, they're broken up into eight page chapters so each chapter uh, ends with a cliffhanger a European graphic novel does not have cliffhangers in the middle of the story right <laughs> They don't even have that thing where you uh, end the page uh, in, sus in suspense for what happens in the next page. It's just part of the story. You right, they don't they you don't page it. turns in it. No, 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 no. They don't think they don't That's think like that. that. But but like I can I can see why someone would find it boring. I mean I don't because it's actually what I want. It's what I expect from a european graphic album but if you're if you're not expecting that i mean it's probably a reason why not a lot of european graphic albums make it over here because the audience isn't used to them but if you read everything if you read the entire album it everything makes more sense because you're yeah. even if you decide you want to stop at this page and come back later uh you're thinking of the story as one story Right. Reading it in chapters when it's not designed that way. Right, when it's not chapters. It, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, an incomplete reading experience. Right. But like I said, I expect it, so I'm okay with it. Even even if I laugh sometimes and I'm like, he ended it right on his O face in the middle of the thing. <laughs> What? That's strange. I say so. not enough comics ends on an O face. <laughs> <laughs> if only there were more. 
I can't imagine that Penthouse Comics is going to find the potential audience for that material. Like, I don't know. Like we've said before, it, it the first issue sold 30,000 copies, which I think must be pretty good. And they said the second issue around 25,000 copies. I, I think that's the... I I would think that's their ceiling. Hmm. I don't think they're ever going to sell more than 30,000 copies. But if they can sell around that, I think they'll be okay. And then they said, who knows how many of the graphic albums they can sell? What are they going to be priced at? Where are they going to be? I don't know. But I have, um, speaking of O faces, um, I backed a couple of Kickstarters, uh, digital stuff. Um, and I really like the, uh, I noticed, I've only seen it on Kickstarter, not safe for work comics, generally. That, that's sort of the category. And I seem to be on the not safe for work queer list, too. Because I backed a couple of those and I keep getting more. Um, but I like the idea of labeling them not safe for work comics because people know what that means and accept it. Like, um, if you label them adult comics, people aren't going to be interested. If you label them, you know, uh, triple X comics, people aren't going to be interested. The, the, but people are okay with not safe for work stuff because that's something they're used to. And I never realized it before seeing it pop up all the time on Kickstarter. People are used to that label. And they're okay with it. It just means you don't open it, you know, you don't show it to anyone at work. I'm sure people open them at work, not safe for work links and stuff. But I was like, you know what? That's a, whoever came up with that, that's a good marketing idea. That's a very good marketing idea. As you're talking yeah. about it, you know, um, I, I was just sitting here thinking about it. And it's like, yeah, I, I've I've worked in the industry for a very long time. I don't right. normally talk about some of the manga stuff that I worked on because some of them was the adult stuff. Right. And so it's like, yeah, but I also work on children's books, so I don't advertise the right. adult stuff. But I think I would be easier for me to say not safe for work. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because People there was know always what that is and accept it. Yeah. Because if you were to say I work on adult comics, they'd be like Oh, they give you the side eye, like, oh, you're right. a pornographer. It's like, no, nah, they're drawings of people who are naked. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. But not safe for work for comics. Work? It's like, oh, that, I'll, yeah. I'll read a not safe for work comic. I think your average person would, wouldn't would have that much problem with a not safe for work comic. They yeah, just think, oh, that because is they know what it great is. Great name. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was like, now I keep getting them. <laughs> <laughs> Keep yeah, getting that, Kickstarters for them. So I had also recently uh, helped with a Kickstart that I had opted for getting the books digitally. Uh huh. And it wasn't until you mentioned it, I have not looked at those books. And I think it was yeah. because I had downloaded them digitally, and I ne and I didn't even bother to open them up to look at them. And I have to see. I don't. I'm not even sure where I download them to. I'm going to go look now. I think I might I, just download them to my regular download folder, but I have not moved them into a folder for printed books. Uh, the um, the comic book um, iPad thing I use uh, comic reading is called iComics, and it works pretty well. But I just got three comics from a Jimmy Palm. I don't even know if these were the add-ons or the me. I don't think they were the, I think these are the add-ons to the comic I got, I backed, but I think the comic I backed isn't, I can't even keep, that's the problem with Kickstarter. Who can keep track? Um, but it was fan, fantasima, fanti, fantisma. How, how do you pronounce it? How would you pronounce that? Fantasima. 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 Okay, Fantasima. I think I can go with that. I just wasn't getting the 
<laughs> the uh, right amount of syllables. So I got one. Whoops. Let me get out of there. Issue one. I haven't read these yet. There's issue two. Fantasima. And there's issue three. Like I said, I think these were add-ons. Paper Films is Jimmy's uh, publishing uh, his uh, publishing. Jimmy Palmiotti. Company. You're right, Jimmy Palmiotti. I really should mention his last name, shouldn't I? Uh -huh. <laughs> we we know him as Jimmy, but <laughs> <laughs> Man, everybody out there doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those were the three add-on books. I can't remember which book I backed, but I think those were three add-ons. Um, so I have those to read. Uh, like I said, but you're right. I'm I'm always like, oh, I have to I have to remember to download them and read them. So so what I just did in that iComics, you can set up separate sort of folders for your comics. So I put all my Kickstarter comics in one in a Kickstarter folder, so I know I can go and read them there. And the program you use is called iComics. iComics, yeah, it works pretty right. well. I'll look that one up. Yeah, so the ones I'm... that I picked up are three issues, or the first three issues of a series called Evermind, okay. and they're by Two Four Seven Comics, and it's uh, art by Sean Chen. That was why okay. I ended up doing it because well, yeah, he's we good. Because we know Sean, he's a good friend. And I uh, never met written... Sean, but he's good. Oh, good have... artwork. Okay. I've never Sean, met him. No. Sean has the habit of always stopping in at the office to drop off his artwork, and it's funny because okay. he's one of these guys that would show up just with the artwork in one hand and the skateboard in the other hand, because ah. that's how he that's how he traveled through the city was on a skateboard, and so he would come to the office to drop off his Iron Man pages. So, um, so Sean was one of those guys that would always okay. stop by and we would talk comics all the time. So, uh, and it's written by Daniel Wu. Okay. Wu. W V. I'm sorry. W U. So okay. I think it's just pronounced Wu. Uh, colored by Sean, um, penciled and written by Sean Chen, co-created by Daniel Wu. And then it's colored by Tom Chu and okay. lettered by. And world design, uh -huh. and uh, solid artwork by Sean Chen, great coloring by Tom Chu. And other than that, I know nothing else of it because uh. I had I had you know contribute to the Kickstarter. I don't know how long ago, so I don't even remember the video they had Wait, with me, it. Let me show you the other program I use to move things on. Do you, do you read on an iPad? Uh, yes, I, I I actually do like how comic books look on an iPad. Right. Uh, so I, I don't like how they look on an iPhone. I think it's too small. And the computer isn't too bad, but I prefer it on an iPad. I have this one program called File Browser. It's like $5. And this over the Wi-Fi hooks up with my computers. So oh, okay. what I do is um, all I have to do, and, and you just navigate through here. And here, I have these ones in my download. Do do do. It's uh, connecting, and then like I said, I usually I move like those Jimmy. I move it from my downloads folder into my comics hard drive. But I haven't done that yet. So like here's the issue of Fantasma right there. I just click on it over here, hit share. I hit the share button, then it downloads it, and it pops up, and there's iComics. So I just click on the iComics app, and it moves it from my uh, computer onto my iPad really easily. I don't have to do anything but hit those two buttons. So if you've oh, never man. used File Browser, it's a good app to move things between your iPad and your computer. And that's how I bring things into iComics. Uh, and 62 Lefty Blues has a good uh, comment here. I'm curious to see if they can get to 10 issues of Penthouse Comics. 
Let's say we set that up as the over under 10 issues. Would you bet on the over or the under? It's not is My... it monthly or bi monthly? It's bi monthly. Okay. So that means it's got to last almost two years. I th- my gut feeling is under. Yeah, I, <laughs> my gut I feel. I mean. I mean, what did the original ones? How long did the original ones last? The original Penthouse comics, I think, went yeah. for a while. I can't remember. Did it? Okay, I don't recall how long it went. It must. Have, it went for a couple of years at least, but I can't recall exactly. Penthouse comics. Had... I guess are they doing new materials or is it just? It, it's all European stuff, as far as I can tell. There's nothing new in it. Thirty-six issues. The original. Thirty-six, 36? issues. Thirty-six. I see. I can. Yeah, Undead Quinn can see it drop under fifteen k. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I think ten will be the limit, Lefty. So, so you're gonna bet the over or the under, sleepy reader. <laughs> I don't think they'll make it. Sixty-two Lefty Blues is betting the under. I'll buy I'm, them and throw I'm, them away. <laughs> I'm betting going over, but not, but but not much. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go with with twelve issues. Yeah. Okay. She's so got the over. Spec buy. I noticed in Penthouse Comics. They draw Danny Tejo in one of the story in Gun uh, Trejo. Yeah, I think they did, now that you mentioned it. I think I remember seeing that, too. Evermind by Sean Chen and Daniel Wu, 247 comic. I'm under. 17 books, old run. I think there were two volumes, so maybe that's what there were. Eight issues is my bet. A lot of people betting the under. I'm thinking nine. I think it'll reach nine. nine? I think it'll reach ten, yeah. That, that's, that's, my, that's my gut... <laughs> feeling for it for some reason i'm with paolo and think they can make 12 but that just might be because i like the number 12 i don't i don't think it's based on any rational thoughts uh, 10 will be ready to go but they're yeah. going to cancel it on nine ah okay <laughs> the old penthouse comics sure. came back out into the first run they reprinted the first issues in the comic book size okay how many are out so far? Two. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna say six. Six. The whole two ten dollar comic. The first issue sold thirty thousand copies. The second issue they say is somewhere around twenty five thousand copies. So that's not bad. But I like like uh, undead Quinn. Was that him who said said uh, fifty? I can see it. it I, yeah. I can see it drop, you know, 2,500 copies an issue and be down to 15K in no time. And then when it gets under 10K, you know, but I put on my pull list, so I'll enjoy it while it's here. And like I said, we also have, supposedly, they're putting these out as graphic novels, too. So if they're using the magazine as a loss leader to put out the graphic novels, maybe that can make it last a little longer. Or maybe no one will buy the graphic novels because they already have it in the monthly issues. I don't know. It's a it's a tough call. The most recent previews it's had kind number of like three what? for order, and that was for June. Yeah. Can you guys, Paolo, I guess, remind me in the other live that you, YouTube shows everyone's connected to? I like, uh, what, what live YouTube shows are you connected to? I know Wilson is on TikTok going live usually Friday nights. Yeah, Penthouse is the third in June. We know the, they're getting the three. The, the Far Color Fossils, although the program, uh, the show has changed a bit. So Graphic Man is now doing one guest a week. Ah. Uh-huh. Uh, and forward. the last, the last one was, was the latest was Charlton sixty six and two hours of showing cowboy comics from the fifties and sixties. <laughs> and so Paolo will be on there again sometime. Uh, sometime, yeah. And uh, maybe, and... We'll, maybe we'll be on Tim Howler Mouse's channels one of these weeks. You never know. He's been doing early yeah. Sunday morning stuff, right? Right, and that he does yeah, a lot. I always, so... I always yeah. end up catching it at the very end of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're not the only one. There's a lot of people who show up. Hey, here I am. And then Tim says, 
Oh, you cut you cut uh, you cut me just as I was, uh, as I was about to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, because he. I mean, when I say Sunday morning, I mean eight thirty Sunday morning. Like, yeah. I usually go for a bike ride at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. So I often I come back and like ten thirty. I'm like, he was on at eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I finished lunch and and he's been on for for half an hour usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But maybe we'll show up on his show one day. We'll see, because <laughs> that's how the our, our our the Cavern of Chaos started over on his channel. Matter of fact, what episode number is this? Fifty five seventy two point seventy. That means it's been seventy two weeks since we showed up on Tim's channel at all. For, mm -hmm. uh, like, wow, it's been a while. I told you to restart from a new number one, so we can have more viewers. <laughs> <laughs> no one even knows what that number means. <laughs> haven't you haven't you learned from Marvel? You always start at number one every three months. <laughs> Chris Jeruso's Power Hour Adventure Show. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> we can no, we can call Neither this show I. the Chris Jeruso Power Hour Adventure Show. <laughs> where we talk and Chris draws. Though I have to say, in <laughs> one more week, this is kind of crazy. I think in one more week, it'll be 10 years since I started my pull list haul. Every week for 10 years, I've been showing. How nuts is that? How is that's? I'm just like, really? I was 47? Well, I'm like, when I'm, I'm 57, in 10 more years, I'll be 67. That's nuts. That's nuts to use. YouTube to contemplate your own mortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, imagine knowing that in 10 years you'll be 10 years older. Yeah. But it's like <laughs> never think about that. But it's like I've been I've been doing a weekly that's what I was saying. Um Don the comic book junkie is probably the only one on YouTube who has more comic book calls than me. But I don't think anyone has done a weekly comic book haul, has as many weekly comic book hauls as me. Just because 52 a year for 10 years, <laughs> it's 520. I, I mean, most people who I know who have been on YouTube as long as or longer than me don't do weekly comic book hauls anymore. I'm just like, it's kind of crazy <laughs> to think that. But I was also thinking maybe this year, uh, part of my, um, I wanted to talk about uh, Photoshop actions and making prints out of everything. I might run a contest this summer for 10 years to give away prints. There you go. And and all our regular commenters have already won. Oh, and, you know, they don't have to join the contest. If they want prints, I'll send them to them. Because they, they, if you're if you're a regular watcher and commenter, you've already won. <laughs> I don't think they have should have to join the contest. <laughs> it's only the people who never comment to. <laughs> the problem with YouTube well, you is to... you really see yourself age. Yeah. <laughs> At least in the beginning, for the first year or two, I just showed my hands. So I didn't. Some of them I showed my face, but mostly for my hauls, I just showed the books. Yeah, many then of my early hauls were change, just. Though. Yeah, the, the many of my hauls, even stuff that I still haven't even posted, because I recorded <laughs> at least. I have recordings for at least uh, probably a year's worth of videos that was like i'll record this i don't know what i'm going to use it for <laughs> but i'm going to record this stuff and um and some of them i haven't posted just because of bad lighting i have so many sketch card videos because sometimes i'll just work on a ton of cards at the same time and you know you can see the sun move across the desk yeah <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> tip goblin says i think we should all swap Art sketch cards at some point. Why not? I got a thousand of them or two thousand <laughs> that I've made that I used to make my uh, drifting and dreaming comic strip. So you got a lot of sketch cards. Speaking of mortality and, and weekly shows, how many cartoonist kayfabes do you think Jim Rugg uh, has? <laughs> that is a solid question because they were doing a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. So they had to be made. I, I would imagine. I don't know how close they live to each other, but I imagine they'd get together like once a week on Saturday and they can knock out a bunch of them. 
No, a, a, few, a few years ago, they they even they they even showed the the live recordings, and it was yeah. like a, a six hour video on Tuesday. Wow. And then they break it up, and then they break it up into into little videos. Ah. So if they do six, if you're, they're doing six hours, it's twenty minute, twenty minutes each. That's eight. Well, uh, average. So let let's say fifteen. You can knock, right. knock out fifteen videos in one day. Then they did. They'd have to have the material for all fifteen, but. So I think 15 might be a little, but even if it's 10, there'd, there'd be a lot in the bank for. Mm -hmm. Wow, I man, I'm I'm just still mad at Ed Piscor. Uh, I'm in, I'm in that state. They, they say that's one of the stages of uh, suicide. If you you know, as you're mad at the person who committed suicide because you know they ups, it's upsetting. And when I saw that, they had a little piece, a little something on. Uh, he had a niece who I think she's just tur around turning 18. And he had been making comics with her since she was a little kid. You know, they had a picture of him showing her how to make comics when she was about six and her making comics. And just the idea that, you know. She and they were about to like make some comic together, I think, because you know she's a grown up now and she wants to make some comics. And just the idea that he would leave her behind makes me go, just makes me angry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 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 upset for her. I mean, I'm sure she doesn't need be me upset for her. She's upset, but I'm just still I'm I'm in that mad stage. <laughs> but yeah, they probably got a few in the bank. Uh, there must that must be hard on Jim Rugg's nerves being bound to release the catalog, though he had yeah, I imagine that's rough. Uh, well, and he's not, he might be mad at him too. Like you said, that's one of the he, stages. He's not bound to release anything. Uh wants to. Well, last wills and test uh, last will and testimony is actually not a legally binding yeah. document. And it's he, not he, a contract. Yeah, he just wants to. Good morning. People res people respect last wills, but Hello, hello, Azar. From Malaysia. What time is it in Malaysia right now? I guess it's morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and here, here is a comic that wasn't worth five dollars. Blown away by Zach Thompson, Nicola Izzo, and Francesca Stagala. I can pronounce all their names. Zach Thompson is the writer. Nicola Izzo is illustrated by, and Fran Francesco Sagala is colored by. And it wasn't bad. Uh, it was a story of this woman who's a photographer, and she's been hired to uh, try to take photographs of this rare bird up in these glaciers somewhere. And she sees these two guys climbing the glacier. And then they get to the top of the glacier and start to fight and then disappear. So she's like, I got to find them. And it wasn't, if it was a $4 comic, I may buy another issue. Five, $5. And I also don't like Boom's physical comics. They're self-covered. And so the cover is real, and they're on really thin paper. And for five dollars, I want a better physical comic. Like that, if it was four dollars, maybe I'd buy a second issue. If it had a cardstock cover, maybe I'd buy a second issue. But as is, I'm not buying a second issue. But it wasn't bad. It, it was solid. It was okay. If, like I said, if it wasn't a if it was an image comic, maybe I'd buy it. Though all their comics aren't self... A lot of their comics are self-covered, too. Savage Dragon is self-covered. But, um... I mean in a respectful, moral way. Yeah. Ed Piscor will be missed. Love Cartoonist Kayfig. Have Jim Rugg and Tom Scioli upload their video in it? I don't know if they have, but I think they are. I, I know, um... 
I'm not su I'm not subscribed to to, to Tom Scholey's channel, so I don't know if, if yeah. he did anything over there. I I know he wants to keep cartoonist K Fabe going, Jim Rugg. So I still haven't read any Jim Rugg comics. I don't think. Oh, uh, I'll I'll get the the one I have out of storage for next <laughs> week. One model nation. It was drawn by Rug and and written by the vocalist of the Dandy Warhols, I think. Ah. Have you, here's a question that happens in indie comics every now and then. Have you ever listened to a playlist by a comics creator? <laughs> sometimes they go, you know, here are the playlists I was listening to as I created this comic. Uh, who was it? Um, J.H. Williams the third in that sideways mm. comic of his always had playlists in the back, and I've seen it done other times too. And never once have I even read the play because it's always bands I don't know. <laughs> so it's like, How I'm do you know like, it's yeah. bands you don't know if you have never once read the playlist? Because I glanced at it and didn't see any band oh. names I recognized. Oh, okay. So you did read. <laughs> Busted. Chris has always got to bust me at least once a show. <laughs> yeah. I, I I feel like if the comic doesn't come with the actual audio with it, I, I don't go looking for it. You know, <laughs> I was used to getting it with the book, like uh, <laughs> Break Chain with KRS-One. So we got the, the disc, the <laughs> CD. Uh, the Saturday morning cartoon ones, I think we had gotten a tape at least with that one. So if it doesn't come with it, you know, that I, one I, I mentioned, um, that was sold out. Uh, what's the furthest place from here? Issue one came with a vinyl record. Yeah. If you could get that. And I noticed like issue six did too. You can get them on eBay now. You couldn't get them when it first came out, but now you can get them on eBay for about 10, 15 bucks. I, I almost ordered one, but ended up not. Oh, and by the way, I, the I technology um, still exists. Cereal boxes used to come with them right on the back of them, and they were square. <laughs> <laughs> I actually bought a piece of original art. I don't have oh, it yet. Oh, I bought something by um, Elsa Charitier from um, Love Everlasting. I, I a couple weeks ago I was like, oh, I wonder. I think I mentioned I may have mentioned it last week. I can't remember. I wonder how much her original art goes for. And she's got a website, elsacharitier.com, where you can go and she sells her original art. And um an inked page is anywhere from $350 to five hundred dollars. But I bought a pencil page, which isn't really complete pencils. Uh, for $150. I think it comes from issue seven, and it's a bunch of people dancing. Just because I like dancing drawings. And I actually think the pencil drawing was a little livelier than the inked one, but her ink stuff is really nice too. She inks over blue line. And uh, I think the pencils are only nine by 12, and the inks are, you know, 11 by 17. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to pull the trigger on this and spend $150 because I haven't got a piece of original art in a long time. And I kind of, I was like, all right, I'll get one. <laughs> but when it comes, I'll, of course, show it off on the show. I have most of Rug stuff. I think he would really like the Plain Janes, Jared. Okay, I'll have to look that one up. Ram V coordinates music to his story, Radio Apocalypse. Only two issues came out after Vault stopped paying them. Whoops. Oh, that's right. Also, that reminded me that, um, well, I think Scott Connor posted it to me directly, not on our COC page, that uh, he heard that um, IDW was going to file for bankruptcy soon, which I think I heard a while ago, but I don't know if this is a new soon. But I was like, oh, the, the the owner's son didn't save them? That was the whole... 
It, that, I remember we read that a while ago when uh, the new owner of IDW brought in his son to be CEO or something like that. Yeah. Like, oh, that'll save them. Yeah. And, well, they've been bleeding money for hemorrhaging money for 10 years now. So yeah. who, whichever which, whichever fund uh, is bankrolling them, it's probably the set. Undead Queen else. seconds radio apocalypse. Too bad we'll never know for real how it ends. <laughs> yeah, another see another 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 boom book I got, which is David Lapham, since it's always worth it. Is but as a five dollar book is under heist, and this is the one that's about. Um, it's funny because at first I thought it took place in L.A., but it's New York City, I believe, um, where some underground, you know, some subway or underground workers saw some thieves planning a heist. So then they decided to rip off the thieves. But of course, being a David Lapham book, things do not go right. And I think... From the, he keeps dropping clues. I think our lead characters are dead. And they're like running around kind of in some hellish afterlife, except that hellish afterlife is just them failing at the heist. And now guys are after them and they have to run run for their lives kind of thing. Because, and like, I think at the end, the lead character sees his own dead body in a hole after seeing his dead friend. And it's like, there's gangs. So I think it's like a, it's some sort of hellish afterworld where it's just a continuation of the regular world, except things are really bad for them. <laughs> so, you know, if you like a David Lapham story, this is a pretty good David Lapham story. And Maria Lapham, his wife's working on it with him. I assume it's his wife. They got the same last name. And I think she's always been his publisher. I'm shocked. They dug a long hole. Because that's radio. Only read Ram V. Layla Star Detective Comics. We'll buy his other comics. Any recommendation? Um, Sleepy Reader might have some recommendation for you. I there was some reason that I wasn't buying Ram V. Maybe because I wasn't a fan of Layla Starr and one other thing. Not that he was bad, but I can't remember. I can't remember why I was staying away from Ram V. So maybe I'll have to pick something of his up to see. I think it just could be because I find his name silly, even though I know it's just an abbreviation for his last name. I trade weight a lot of books. My LCS gives 10% off comics and 20% off trade paper. Yeah. Um, like I've said it before, the Brooklyn Bridge effect. If you're a modern comic book buyer, you're either... Um, I'll explain why I call it the Brooklyn Bridge effect. Because as you're driving down the FDR, going over in the Brooklyn Bridge, there's almost always traffic. And there's, you know, right turn lanes where you pull off the, the to go on the bridge and they're always backed up and you you have two choices you can be the sucker who pulls into line and waits or you can be the asshole who cuts in front of the line those are your only two choices there's no magical third choice uh, with comic books you're either the the sucker who buys the individual issues or the asshole who say i'll wait for the suckers to buy all the individual issues and then buy the trade at a discount it's like those are your only two choices you're you're a sucker or an asshole by comics these days. So <laughs> Palo's the asshole. I'm the sucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't blame you for waiting for the whole story and 20% off. Why wouldn't you? Right. Blue and Green is excellent. A horror type book. Okay. Ram V Swamp Thing to check out. And Ram V did Black Mamba, which is good too. Has a new kaiju series out called Dawn Runner. Uh, check that out. Mm -hmm. And his Catwoman. Lots of Ram V uh, recommendations here. By the way, I spawn still two ninety nine. 
still worth it. Like I said, the reason I started picking it up was because it was two ninety nine, and I'm enjoying it. Rory McConville is a pretty good. He's a good. He uh, his he wrote um, time before time. I think with someone else too. That's like an A in my book. His time before time, but Spawn. I mean, compared to other Spawn writers, he's definitely an A plus. But well, this is a solid, you know, B plus comic spawn now. And Brett Booth is drawing it, but I wasn't up. Adelso Cor Corona is inking it, and I wasn't a huge fan of the inks. The inks just seemed like they weren't there most of the time. Like there's not a lot of spotting of blacks. And I don't know how much he's enhancing the pencils. Like the other two, the other two issues that Brett Booth drew, I think were looked better than this issue. But the storytelling was excellent. Brett Booth is a good storyteller. Hold on a second. My sinuses are clogging. I have to blow my nose. Speaking of Spawn, when I was at the comic book shop yesterday, <clears throat> I did see that cover for, what is it, Rat Bastard or Street Bastard or something like that? It's a $20.99 book. Rat uh, City? So I, I, Rat City. There you go. Uh, I almost picked it up because I saw it and it's like, hmm, that might be interesting. Because, again, it's starting with a number one. It's like I was really tempted, but I just didn't pick it up. By the way, I was looking at my Facebook memories today, and on this very day, in 2022, I was complaining about my sinuses, and in 2019, I was complaining about my sinuses. I think I might have some sort of allergy. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Nah. Are you, re be. Are you reusing old uh, scripts? <laughs> <laughs> Is Catwoman is thin on the link. Oh, Rat City. Oh, oh is Ram V writing Rat City too? Right. I know that's a new Spawn Universe one. No, I was mentioning I saw Rat the Rat City ah, on the shelf yesterday. Okay. And I was really tempted to pick it up, but it was like, okay. oh, I wasn't sure to pick up another book. Or it's like, uh, I think the, the the books that I got, I was happy with. Well, uh, since it's a Spawn yeah. book. The first issue, uh, Sleepy Reader said, was five dollars, but it has extra pages. And the second issue is only going to be two ninety nine, so it's going to be a two ninety nine book, like the rest of the Spawn ones. Okay, just to let you know, in case that affects how you think about buying it. <laughs> I almost bought a Venom twenty ninety nine book yesterday. Says Tit Goblin, forgot for a second. I cut off all buying. <laughs> Well, maybe you can get it when twenty ninety nine rolls around. And here's a different sort of thing I bought this week, just on a whim, because it was only eight dollars. The Marvel versus System Upper Deck Card Game A Force. Have you ever heard of this? It's like sort of like a Magic the Gathering card duel game, except the versus system was invented like, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. And there were a bunch of Marvel and DC cards, but then I think they stopped making them. They kind of went out of business. But in recent years, I've noticed them popping up with new stuff again. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'm like, I haven't looked at, I think I, I, think I even have some old cards like stuck in a closet that I bought for like pennies on the dollar when the system was, when the, you know, the card game was going out of business, but I guess they brought them back. And, it, and they also had like, this system can have anyone fight anyone. So they have like a DC versus packs too, and other characters versus packs, but I haven't seen any of these cards in a long, long time, but I think they cost me eight bucks on Amazon. So I was like, let me try them. Then of course, 
being geeky. I, I had them sit. I had to make boxes for them because the cards were just in there like shrink wrapped. So I had them at their two pre-made decks, but I'm like, I, and I had them like sitting on my drawing table, but they're just kind of loose. And I was like, you know what? I, they're going to, they're going to go everywhere. So here, here, and it looks like main, there's main character cards, black cat, dark Phoenix. Uh, and there's two different versions of the main character cards. Like there's level one enchantress and level two enchantress. I was looking at some um, playthroughs, mystique main character. Then they have black cat supporting character. So there's like different. So there's like a main character version of the card and a supporting character version of the card. I found that interesting. But I don't have to watch YouTube to see how the game is played. Whoa. Cards flying everywhere. But I... but I made these boxes out of like Bristol board. So I just uh, I made them an illustrator, printed them out, and just like taped them together. So now I have boxes <laughs> to put the card decks in so they won't fly everywhere. As I Someday you flip, figure out flip how them to out of your hand. Because <laughs> of course I had them just sitting on my drawing table. And then every time I would move stuff around, they would fall, you know, the whole deck would come apart. And I'm like, you know what? I need some place to put them. Luckily, I've made boxes for cards before. All right, who wants to do a read, rip, and slab? Let's do it. What Sounds decade good. do you want? Anywhere from the 40s to the 90s. To 70s. Okay. Let's go. Let's do Marvel 70s. 1976, February. Marvel. Some stuff near and dear to our hearts. There we go. We have got Marvel 2 and 1, The Thing in Morbius, Doctor Strange, where he fights Dracula, and Omega the Unknown versus the Hulk, issue 2. I don't think I've read that Thing in Morbius, but the other two I've read. I would read Thing and Morbius because I really do enjoy the Thing stories. He's a good uh, he's a good team up guy. No one uh, ever wants a '90s read Rip and Slab. <laughs> I think I think '90s is okay. Once we get into the aughts and the 2010s, that's when it gets less interesting. <laughs> I would slab Omega the Unknown. I would read Thing with Morbius, and Ooh, I wouldn't want to rip a Doctor Strange, but <laughs> a nice Gene Cole and Dracula. I know, Doctor yeah. Man. You know what? I'm I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to slab Doctor Strange, and I'm going to rip Omega the Unknown, ah, and try to Omega cut it. Unknown. Try to cut it with a Hulk. Try to cut it between the Hulk and him. Ah, I think that's a Jim Mooney cover on Omega. I'm not I mistaken. Could be. I'm not 100% sure, but I think he was doing the insides and some of the covers. And John Romita did some of the covers, but I don't think that's Romita. It's funny how the Thing in Mobius cover is very similar to the Omega the Unknown cover. So, <laughs> which is giving me a hard choice of which character Remember I would Gene change. Nolan cover? That's blasphemy. <laughs> that, that's why I changed my mind. That's why I ended up, I ended up saving it and I slabbed it. Uh, I think I would exchange either Mobius or the Hulk for the Dolphin. But they're both <laughs> doing kind of the same pose. Oh, it's yeah, that's both, right. Look at that. It's almost like the same cover, but, you know, different characters. I yeah. would I would Dolphin Morbius. <laughs> and I think I would have the Flamingos watching Doctor Strange and Dracula because you got two Stranges on that cover. 
<laughs> and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And they'd have to be at that Dutch angle. Notice the clock behind yeah. them is tilted. Exactly. Huh. I'm going to rip Marvel 2 in 1. Slab Omega. Mainly because of the title, Slaughter in Ninth Avenue. Ah, it's a yeah. better title than The Return of the Living Eraser. <laughs> and I'm going to re read Doctor Strange, even though I've already read that story. Uh, in fact, you have to read Tomb of Dracula the same month yeah. because it's a two-part story. It's been many, many years since I read that story. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it <laughs> that many years. I am going to dolphin Doctor Strange's astral form. Huh. It'll be a dolphin astral form. <laughs> huh. And I'm going to put the flamingos in the twin one cover, uh, almost getting squashed by by Ben's feet. Wow! And Omega the Unknown and Doctor Strange are both. Oh, all three of them are Dutch Angle covers. I didn't even notice that. Dutch Angle is when you tilt the camera. I don't know why they call it that. Probably some Dutch filmmakers. When you tilt the horizon line so it's on a uh, diagonal instead of straight across, as the horizon normally is. And we, Let's uh, see. many of us will be familiar with it in the Batman TV series. Yes. Because every time they showed the villains, they would always make it crooked so you could that, know you're that, looking at the crooked bad guys. That might be where I first read the term Dutch angle with something with the Batman 66 TV show. 62 Lefty Bruce is going to read the thing and Morbius slab Doctor Strange and rip Omega. <laughs> rip a Gene Colon cover? That's blasphemy. Undead Queen is going to read Marvel 2 and 1, slab Doctor Strange and rip Omega. Poor Omega. Tit Goblin is going to read Strange, slab the thing, rip Omega. Dolphin Strange's ghost. Oh, there we go again. And put Art Wasp. On the Omega corner box heads. <laughs> I am going to... Omega the Unknown is one of my favorite Marvel childhood books. I think Battlefield Earth for worst Dutch angle. <laughs> so I'm going to slab Omega the Unknown. Because that one is just my... Like I said, it's one of my favorite series from my childhood. I think it still holds up, too. I think I'm on board with Paolo. I'm going to read Doctor Strange... And I'm going to rip Thing and Morbius. I'm going to put the flamingos at a Dutch angle on that pink building behind Omega the Unknown. So they're going to be way off in the distance watching the action. <laughs> then I'm going to turn Dracula into the dolphin. <laughs> I want a vampire dolphin. He's going to have vampire teeth and everything. Yeah. And there will be a, a crossover with Howard the Duck <laughs> with Hal Cow. And what's Chris going to do? I think the dolphin show also. I'm going to rip. The... Uh, I'm going to rip Thing and Morbius because everyone hates the Morbius movie. <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to slab Doctor Strange because uh, that's the most valuable comic here, and uh, it's going to escalate in value once I slab it. <laughs> Personally, I want to read Chris Jeruso. I want to read Omega the Unknown because the title alone has me curious to like, like I, I got to know what this is. Uh huh. Now here's a question. Speaking of Chris slabbed by Chris Jeruso, if Chris Jeruso signed a comic and sent it in to be slabbed by cgc would they verify the signature no because they have to witness the signature being done yeah but Wrong! sending it in his credit card is paying for it he called them up and said i signed these comics would they say no oh, if it I'm sorry. If it's his own comics, then maybe. His own I'm comics. thinking him just signing a comic and sending it in. <laughs> that's the way I kind of. That's the way I kind of. Well, you know, yeah, maybe that's... they could verify that too. Uh, I did. I did a bunch of commissions for a guy who asked me to send them directly to CGC, and so 
Be because of that arrangement, CGC approves my signature on everything. See, Chris, Chris has an answer for us. It's not even hypothetical. As long as Chris sends them in, CGC will verify it. Or See, any creator. Yeah, any creator. Maybe not Paolo because uh, they don't like him, <laughs> I heard. They don't. They haven't met me yet, but they don't already <laughs> know they don't like me. I think even Rag Paulo, if I, if I said, if I said, I have this book, if I called CGC, I said, I got this book and I want Paulo to sign it and then send it directly to you. Can you, can, will you certify that? They'd say yes. Tit you know, wants just, to ravage 299 signed by you. By me? Yeah. I mean, that's like the most valuable of the 2099 books because that's Stan Lee's most famous creation. Oh, of course. <laughs> the biggest and the best. Here's another comic I got this week from Vault. This one well worth the $5. Beyond Real. This is the one that... Um, in the first issue, a woman gets into a near-fatal... Near um car crash where her boyfriend dies then she finds out that she's living in a simulation which is glitching and she is the glitch so some like people come to try and fix her and she won't let them because she wants them to make her boyfriend alive again so then since then she's been on the quest in this virtual world beyond real trying to get her boyfriend alive again. But the art in this has been terrific. And in this issue, we get another sort of visualization of this virtual world that's just really good. I mean, look at that. And it's like, this is different from this last issue's visualization of this virtual world, which was much more computery. Um, the story is they're just basically on a quest looking for the source. So the story isn't all that, but wow, is the art, the art and storytelling is really nice. And like I said, this is just so different from last issue, which I was blown away by the art on too. So I got to say, I've really enjoyed, like, I've really enjoyed this book. Very visual, visually creative and imaginative. Um, and the artist is, let me get the artist here. Let me see if I need Paolo for it. And the artist is. I don't think so. Uh, Fabiana Moscolo. Vincenzo Riccardi. And Dennis Menhiri. I don't know if you pronounce that last E. I tend to pronounce the last E's on names now just because, but in, 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 you know, American versions, you don't always pronounce the last E, but so many Americans I know have gone to pronouncing the last E on whatever their name is. Yeah, they, they probably shouldn't. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fabiana Mascolo, Vincenzo Riccardi. Dennis men here. I don't know. I don't know where that guy's from. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly the Italian Americans I know who have gone to pronouncing the last e on their names. But really nice. I, I another just so imaginative with the color and drawings. Good stuff right here. Uh, Vault Beyond Real. Once again, this is a five dollar book, but I got my five dollars worth out of this. <laughs> I still would prefer. Uh, I actually pay uh, four sixty nine. I think I get ten percent off. But still, I'd rather pay. You know, four dollars. Have you read any comics lately, Chris? Yes, I have. What have you read? Void Rivals Void number eight. Rivals. Yeah, 
It was I, good. I I was just told <laughs> by Roy, my LCS owner, that Chris, another guy who used to work at the comic shop, who has been enjoying Void Rivals, just stopped reading it because it got too popular. <laughs> okay, that's wild. <laughs> All right. I don't know if he was too being facetious or that was real. It could go either way with Chris. <laughs> this this other Chris, not Chris DeRusso. <laughs> well, I've been enjoying Void Rivals all along as i have all the energon universe books right. including cobra commander number four cobra commander uh i'm digging it digging to energon skybound energon home run yeah a lot of people are liking that <laughs> oh my god face palm undead queen yeah <laughs> Sleepy Reader was just having a tough time. I think he was reading uh, Transformers number seven. And new artist. He's a couple, yeah, he's a, he liked it, but what he did was he. I think he said he has the first trade on order because you know, been good word of mouth on that stuff, and Daniel Warren Johnston is good. Uh, then he said, you know, why don't I just jump in with issue seven and I'll, you know, read the trade whenever I get it. And he jumped in I mean, on issue seven you, and had no idea what's going on. If you were already a teenager or, yeah. or a young adult when a cartoon debuted, no. other media adaptations are gonna not going to no. do it for you. Right. That's why I was like... Uh, he like he's a couple years older than me and I'm too old for Transformers. So Though I might read that Daniel Warren Johnston one sometime. Uh, but it's like, um, and I think someone showed up at the issue seven, at the end of issue seven. And of course he had no idea who it was. And he's, and he's having trouble telling the robots apart because he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Just like I, I would have trouble even, telling the robots apart. I used Energy to know, Universe has been fun. I used to know all of the Transformers who appeared in the cartoon, uh -huh. but it, I never knew the names of every toy. So I may not know every character who, who appears. Uh, you know, I, I've never managed to memorize the, the names of the Beast Wars Transformers. Yeah. The Beast Wars were a, a 3D, for, the, for those who don't know, the Beast Wars were a 3D version of the Transformers where they turned into animals. <laughs> yeah, Seven as a different artist, right? Sleepy noted that. George Corona or Jorge Corona. One or the other. The Transformers appear in the backs of books. The book uh, appear in the book of the books. Yeah, I, I, I actually have the same. You know, it was funny. Uh, I've mentioned this before, of course, reading issue. I only started reading issue Spawn with like 318. So occasionally there was some like dramatic entrance of a character on the last page that was lost on me because I didn't know who the character was. And last issue, I, matter of fact, I commented on it here. There was a dramatic entrance of a character on the last page. And I said it was lost on me because I didn't know who the character was. Then I find out this issue, it's a new character. <laughs> Spawn didn't know who it was. So I'm like, well, no wonder. <laughs> Wait, does that mean you have a first appearance in Spawn? I guess so. Or, oh, or you have to get you have to get it cameo. slapped. You have to get you have to get it slapped right now. <laughs> Do we even Signed have a name? For her? Let's see. It's a first appearance. It doesn't matter who it is. It's a first appearance. All we know is she's wearing angel armor, but she's not an angel because she has superpowers. And all the angels, all the characters from heaven and hell have just been depowered. Okay. And the vampires are killing them all. But yeah, don't even know where she is. Like at the end of this one, Eddie Frank, aka the Reaper, shows up. I don't know who that is. But Spawn wants to save him, so Spawn knows who he is.
Deputy Frank the Reaper. What if you went to the movies and had to sit behind the leader? The Transformers appear on other books. Okay. That was the typo. Robots in disguise. I I really wanted to comment that to Sleepy Reader, but I restrained myself. When he said he couldn't, he didn't know who the robots were, I was going to go, that's because they're in disguise. <laughs> How are you supposed to tell who the robots are when they're in disguise? They're robots in disguise. Mm-hmm. You know that jet uh, jet fire had to be called sky fire in the cartoon because there, there was some already was a jet fire. There was yeah, there was some trademark issues. Plus, uh, the jet fire design uh, comes from comes from a different Japanese producer than than the uh. than the lines they used for the the Autobots and the Decepticons. Robots in disguise. Also, there have been attempts at playing up the fact that Jetfire and Starscream were friends in Cybertron, but they they only explored that in the in Jetfire's first appearance in the cartoon, because when even though Jetfire that's in that episode, there he is. Chris has Jetfire for us. Yeah. As Jetfire the then cartoon, comes back he... without any explanation whatsoever, <laughs> and so he's all, is... and he's an, an Autobot through and through. Now, and one's the, one's the Transformer, the other one is a, a Robotech character. Mm-hmm. Those are the difference between two. And because there's a third mode that the Robotech character could change into. The Transformer was not allowed to tra- to do that transformation in the cartoon. Ah. And it's because they licensed the same mold, but not the character in the name. I'm, I'm hearing <laughs> a lot of things you guys are saying that are wrong. Ah. Skyfire definitely landed on his legs and let some guys out in one of the episodes that he was in. So I see that as paying homage to the Jerwalk mode. Right. Uh, <laughs> that you speak of. Uh, Paul, you said he just he reappeared with no explanation. Yeah, they had a scene where Wheeljack and I think Cliffjumper could be wrong, but they 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 go back to the ice where they left them after his first yeah. appearance, and they just blast him out of the ice. And they're like, "Yeah, we we need you to drive. We need you to fly us somewhere right now." Oh, well, Chris said a bunch of words that didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> uh, Wheel, Wheeljack is one of the Autobots that's actually based on a real life race car. Uh-huh. The they they are painted like like the like the real uh, life race cars that they are based on. Uh, Wheeljack is a 1976 Giro d'Italia. Uh, G- uh, Lancia, Strat- Lancia Stratos tr- Turbo. Uh, Jazz is a 1976 specification uh, FIA Group 5 Porsche 935 in Martini Racing Colors. Uh, Mirage. There is. Mirage is a 1980 uh, Ligier JS11 Formula One car in uh, Ligier Gitan color. And Smokescreen is an IMSA GTO spec Datsun 280 ZX Turbo as driven by Bob Sharp. There it is. That's real Jack. And and uh, although it's the wrong number, uh, it's actually it's the correct. It's the number that uh, it's Bob Sharp's number in the in uh, smoke screen, but with a different number. The car was also uh, raced by Paul Newman. The Paul Newman. Uh-huh. The Paul Newman. Now, Chris, shouldn't you have two of each uh, Transformers so you can have them in car mode and robot mode? Isn't that what real Transformers fans do? I don't know. No, that's what people who have (laughs) money do. do. 
<laughs> well, according to according to some people, real Transformers fans never take the toy out of the box, so you can play with it and transform <laughs> it, which is the whole, whole point of owning them. You play with them in your mind. Yeah. In your mind. No, you have to slap slap the box. Yeah. Slap, yeah. How to put that box in a plastic box. <laughs> it kills me that they have bags to put the CGC cases in. <laughs> it's like you need a bag to protect the case that protects the comet. That's in a bag. <laughs> what? Uh, at this point, the back of the CGC should be a screen where you can read the comic book. <laughs> it should be a hologram where you can read it. <laughs> A hologram of the comic. George Corona has many styles. Yeah, people were saying that he was drawing like um, the previous Transformer stuff. Grandmothers bought my generation GoBots when we asked for Transformers. 90% of GoBot sales. <laughs> a it is mint in box. Nerd voice. Mint in box. Want to do another read, rip, and slab? Pick a decade, Paolo. 90s. The 90s? Yes. Just for Tit Goblin. Yes. Because he said no one wants it, but Paolo does. Let's see. What do we yes, got I in do. the 90s? Do you have something with, uh, with bad girls? Let's see. 1996. I don't, I don't have something with bad girls set up. I'll have to do that for next week. We'll do yeah. something... We're going to go mainstream here. And then let's go, go a little out of the mainstream. With 1992, November, comics I've never seen before. Let's see here. We have got Harbinger, number 14. We have got Hammerlock. Issue number five. And I started putting the, if it was in there, whoever, who did the uh, covers? Andrew Vox, Hard Looks. I don't think Andrew Vox did the cover, though. Maybe, did he? Is he an know? I thought he was the author. One from Dark Horse, one from DC, one from Valiant. So we have a Pieta cover. Yep, we do. I had that harbinger. Now, here's a question. In France, can you do a Peita cover with a man on a woman's lap? Yeah, now you can, yes. <laughs> but back in the 60s, in 1992, could you? In 1992, you could. <laughs> okay. Is the, thing, the, the law is still in the books, but uh -huh. nobody cares anymore. Chris Sprouse did the uh, Hammerlock cover. In 1992, so that's early Sprouse. It's yeah, already pretty good. it's already very good. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's a tough one. Yeah, because I don't know anything about Hammerlock or Hard Look. I would, I would slab Harbinger, because back then Valiant was worth something. <laughs> really, a Howard Simpson Valiant. <laughs> it, it just had to have the Valiant cover ah, And for okay. some reason Everyone went crazy for those books What else uh, did Howard Simpson do? I'm trying to remember I know his name But I can't remember where from Okay so I'm going I'm going I to would... slab Harbinger yet as well Because it's I'll... the only one you know No yeah, I'll read uh... Hard Looks Because I know nothing of it and unfortunately, that means I would have to rip Hammerlock straight down the center, right between the eyes, <laughs> cut that woman in two. And of huh. course, I'll, I'll change Magnus for uh, the dolphin. <laughs> it just it only seems right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I'll put the flamingos uh, in the mirror, looking at the guy, ah. looking at the man in the mirror. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to read Hard Looks. The the cover is actually interesting. So I want to, and I I think I 
from the little I've seen of Andrew Vox, he does look interesting. I'm going to rip Hammerlock because the the masthead reads "Descent into Cyberspace." Yeah, <laughs> and we all know that in the 1990s, people's ideas of cyberspace were now they they look kind of lame. So was well, just weird. Yeah, but let's see what 62 Lefty Blues is going to do. He's going to read Har Luke Locks Vox as a writer. I thought he was. I don't know why that he was credited with drawing the cover. Slab Harbinger and Rip Hammerlock. Let's see what is Tit Goblin going to do. Read Hard Looks, Rip Harbinger, Slab Hammer, Dolphin Cyber Eyes, and Hammer. Art Wasp yeah. for the DC logo. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. I'm going to Dolphin the 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 floating guys as well. Uh, and the flamingos they go on. They go on the on the armed guy's head in, in hard looks. Yet another. Let's see. Read, read hard hard looks. Slab harbinger and rip hammerlock. I think I'm going to slab hard looks because I like that cover. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to rip Harbinger because I feel like ripping a Valiant comic. What the heck? Which means I'm reading Hammerlock. I have no idea what that's going to be like, so may as well. I have zero clue what Hammerlock is about. And let's see. I'm going to put a flamingo on each eye in Hammerlock. So there's going to be an ink, a flamingo cut out in front of the logo, standing on top of each eye. It's it's a Gary Gianni cover uh, on Hard Looks. Okay, and there are two there are two main stories. And the first one has has art by Chris Moeller, and the second by Gary Gianni. And there's a short story in the middle with art by Richard Olson. Only three pages. The first story. Okay, so is this is the hard looks based on something? I think is I think he was a novelist, right? Neil Barrett Jr. was that. And I'm going to dolphin the guy with the gun in the hard looks cover we only see in the mirror. But here's the question: By dolphin the guy, should the shadow also be dolphined, or should the dolphin be casting a guy's shadow? I don't know which one would be better. <laughs> no, the it should be a dolphin shadow, yeah. Dolphin shadow, that might work. <laughs> but that is a weird collection of 90s comics. How about you, Chris? What do you think? Um, let's see. I guess Hammerlock looks like it's the most valuable, so I slab that one. <laughs> Uh, because everybody Har loves Harbinger, cyber. No. yeah. Harbinger, is it Harbinger, right? Am I saying that Harbinger. right? Yes, I'm gonna rip that up because I never knew how to pronounce it in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always said Harbinger, <laughs> and so I feel stupid, so I'm gonna rip that up, and then yeah, I'll read hard looks. You don't need a comic that makes you feel stupid. No. So tear it right up. Yeah. That's the best thing to do with comics that make you feel stupid. <laughs> oh, let's see. The last comic I got this week. Once again, a $5 comic, but worth it. Helen of Windhorn. Where did you say this uh, artist was from? Whoops. Hold on. I made myself full screen. And where's her name? The, you told me how to pronounce her name last week, but I don't remember now. Bilkis. Bilkis Evely. Or Evely or Evely, but it could be Evely. But the first name is pronounced Bilkis. Bilkis. I think you said she was from Argentina or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Bilkis Evely. But we Although get. The, although there, there there are there are a couple of cities uh, in Argentina where everyone is a descendant of Welsh. Ah, <laughs> some, some nice artwork. 
takes place in the 1930s, so it's got 1930s brownish coloring. And this story is really meanderingly taking its time. Uh, Tom King is writing it. This is one of those stories. Um, I think there's a fantasy element in it, but they spent most of this issue having dinner. And it's like, I can tell on my second read through of this, I'm just going to skip most of these captions. That really, you know, they they describe what's going on, but really not in that interesting a way. You know, uh, what is it? Although I retained some trepidations as to what lurked in the shadows of Windhorn after the events of that horrific night, I did not dare raise these concerns to Helen and confirm in any way her paranoia. So I agreed to her suggestion. Thus, many of our lessons from that day on were continued in the grounds and, and gardens of Windhorn, with which, which were well kept and perfectly idyllic. And in the beginning, we encountered nothing more frightening than a flower, but beginnings, like lives, are made to be lost. And so, weeks later, we were interrupted. It's like, whoo, that's a lot of nothing. Someone was reading Lovecraft. <laughs> You know what? You might be right. This could be Lovecraftian. I, I haven't read Lovecraft, but I know what Lovecraftian usually means. And now that you mention it, that could be what he's going for. But I'm like, at times I was like, you know what? I'm enjoying this. The art is terrific, but it's a little too much. Windhorn had great, has great art. Yeah. She did Wonder Woman and Vertigo Dreamer. He Tom Kinged again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of a, a lot of writing that I'm like, you know, as I was reading it, I was going, you know what? Next time through, I'm just going to look at the pictures in this section. They tell the story pretty well. <laughs> I think that sometimes, because like I said, I always read my comics twice before I put them away. So occasionally I'll run into a comic like that when I'm like, you know what? Next time through, I'm probably going to just skip this part. <laughs> have you ever, ever got, ever, have you guys ever thought that as you're reading a comic? About uh, what? That like it, it has to, that next time through, you're going to just going to skip this part when you read it. I probably have not, not any that I can think of. But uh, I'm pretty yeah. sure I have. And, and uh, I once bought the uh, the two set War of the Eternal uh, trade paperbacks for, with with Thor. The ah uh, the the original one, Roy Thomas. Yeah, doing doing the uh, doing the 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 Wagner operas, yeah. and I stopped reading the recap pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if you're reading them like collected, because they weren't meant yeah. to be read collected. Yeah, exactly. The Brazilians used to do that. Um, if they put two star, if they put a, the the two stories in the same comic, uh, they would take out the splash page from the second part because it's usually just repeating the um, the ending of the of the previous issue. So they would take it out. It would serve no purpose. Right. I reread that. I don't know. It must be 10 years ago now. It was okay. The Thor uh, Ragnar. I hadn't read it since I was a kid. And I picked up some collected edition of it. So it was probably at least 10 years ago now. I remember, I remember being surprised that like Roy Thomas left the book right before the climax. It was like Thor 200 was written by... It was like all this stuff building up to Thor 200. Then he just didn't write Thor 200. Someone else did. Uh, I think... I'm not sure if this problem... Uh, it may coincide with... Uh, with Shooter's refusal to let to let people be writer-editors. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, it could have. Because it, it was around 81. So, and Roy quits Conan at the, at the same time. 
Well, what the editors, you know, what the writer editors did in the 90s when I was there is they just had, you know, their buddy edit it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Until Ike put an end to that. That's... I think there was more quality control uh, in the 80s and 90s regarding yeah. right writer editors who also wrote than right. than in the 70s because in the 70s it was more like i i'm now the editor in chief i write whatever i want <laughs> and my buddy writes whatever he wants but not you you write whatever i want yeah huh. and, and then when they or when they left the company and then came back like let's say jerry conway i get to write what okay you can come back to marvel and you get to write whatever you want Okay, <laughs> and that, that's what that's what ended. I mean, uh, uh, Budiansky couldn't write the first four issues of the of the Transformers because he was yet slated to be the editor. So he got somebody else to edit it uh, <laughs> when it became a, uh, an ongoing title. Huh. But it was much of a problem because Mantlo was used to doing the the toy properties. Yeah, uh, but, but then Budiansky continued. Um, Grunwald. Had to had to quit had to quit edit, editing Captain uh, Captain America in order to start writing it, but he stayed as Avengers editor, and then and then he got Roger Stern to quit, <laughs> and John Byrne, right? And, and well, John Byrne would quit at a drop of a hat nah. over some sort of minutiae. He, he... John Byrne. Yeah, he quit that. I was just talking. We were talking earlier about uh, the further adventures of Indiana Jones. I don't even know, you know, Byrne quit that after two issues. I can't remember something something to do with editorial, but I don't know what. I don't remember what. Do not remember. Now I wonder if he is he still doing those fan issues of X Men. I haven't checked in a while. But he had done like 20 issues last I knew. As far as I'm aware of, he's still working on them. Because every once in a while, something will pop up on Facebook on the feed. Like, here's the newest page. And I would see it that way. I'm going to have to go to Burn Robotics and check it out. Because I, I, I actually downloaded like the... I think I just put them into... I think they, they had them posted as JPEGs or something. The first like 10 or 15 issues. And I read one or two of them and just never got back to it. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't that interesting to me. Just wasn't that interesting. I don't know if I can go to 12... The over on this penthouse. So I was just thinking about it going 12 issues. Is it really going to make 12 issues, you think? The, yeah, I suppose they'll, they'll try at least. I think I see a two year contract. Uh, I, let's just say you were in charge of penthouse comics mm-hmm. and you were planning it all out and you were getting the capital, you know, borrowing or investors. You would want at least two years worth of capital in order to yeah. do it, right? I would yeah. think so. But but then you might not make it because you don't count how long it's going to take you to get the first issue out. So you might, uh, when I say you, I just mean the universal you. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would, let's just say you come up with a plan and you're like, I want the first two years worth of capital in order to get 12 issues out. But it takes it really takes you four months to get issue one out. That means you might only make it till issue eight. Are there any ads? No ads. I don't think so. Like I wonder when they started putting issue one together. Mm-hmm. No ads for anything but penthouse comics. Okay, so they don't have outside money coming in. And how much how much do you think it would cost to license the name? Copyright Behemoth Entertainment LLC. 
The Penthouse uh, word mark and key logo are trademarks of Penthouse World Media. Mm-hmm. Printed in then, Canada. Then all of the stories are licensed from the from a French publisher and copyright their respective creators. And, and their ancillary costs involved, not just the royalties. Co-publisher Nathan Yoakum. Ryan Swanson is another co-publisher. Editor-in-chief, Adriana Yoakum. Is that a husband and wife team, maybe? Mm-hmm. Senior editor, Garib Krebs. Editor, Bailey Tarter. Photographer, Paranoid Android Photography. He's the one who did that. Featured model, Maleficent. Contributing writers, contributing artists, cover art. Distributor is Diamond. Office of Publication is... Uh, Richardson, Texas, licensed with Penthouse World Media. Doesn't say anything about where they get the comic license from. But they should have copyright notices. Not uh, not on the actual comics. Huh. Where's the let me see if I can find it. Is there a copy? Is there an indicia somewhere? There's a masthead, but I don't see any indicia. That's weird. Yeah. Why is there no indicia in this? Nope. Just a copyright thing. Hold on. Hold on. Copyright behemoth. And... It just says... Um, no part of this publication may be reproduced in any form or by means electronic or mechanical photocopy recording or otherwise shared in any retrieval system without the written permission of the copyright holders and the publishers. But it doesn't say who they are. So I guess uh, you've got to look up who the copyright holders are if you don't want to know. You can't just say, I'm the copyright holder. <laughs> I looked it up and found out it was me. Is the regular penthouse magazine still in print? No. That's been so gone for that, a long time. So that license probably doesn't cost all that much. No. Yeah, I don't think it's that valuable anymore. Playboy is still in print, I think. I think they only exist digitally. Yeah? I think so. Okay. Uh uh-huh. Well, we should wrap it up for the week. Anybody have any final thoughts? Oh, I got to do a final Doctor Strange. Yeah, you do. Lasers. There we go. Lasers. (laughs) Or did you just get scanned, like, to be put into Tron? (laughs) Oh, maybe they can use my appearance anytime they want in a movie. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, You by doing this, you give me you, you give the Apple Corporation all right in perpetuity to your likeness. Whoa. That was your digital signature. <laughs> but it was funny when Paolo and I just, we were trying all sorts of uh, different yeah. gestures. Yeah. Uh, and and nothing worked. That one worked. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I was like, whoa. That was like the tenth gesture we tried, and of course nothing did anything. And that one did something. It was like, whoa. Did you try the Spider-Man hands? Oh. Didn't try Spider-Man hands, but uh, it's tough. It's tough for it to get it, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, we decided right. we decided that uh, that rock and roll didn't work. It had to be horns. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, horns and it, work? And you, you couldn't have the thumb out either. Yeah. With the thumb out, it doesn't work. So no rock and roll. Apple doesn't like rock and roll. That is wild. <laughs> Wait, what, 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 what about the the Vulcan the Vulcan greeting? Oh, that's a good, hold on. I haven't done this. So <laughs> you long. Does the thumb go out? The, or thumb, the thumb goes out. Okay, it doesn't do anything. No. Okay. Uh, no, no Vulcan greeting. Yep. Oh well. Oh, well. <laughs> Does waving goodbye do anything? I don't know. 
I just shut down my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz hands do anything? <laughs> Jazz hands. No. Nope. <laughs> just Doctor Strange. There you go. <laughs> All right. Amazing. So everybody have a good week out there. Have a good See one, ya. everybody. And we'll catch Bye-bye. you next time.